Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, October 16th. Welcome to the Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, we have three items on our agenda this morning. The first is going to be a conversation about the parking lot districts. Um, that will probably go about an hour or so. The second item is a discussion about an executive regulation regarding residential parking permit programs. Um, that will probably go a little more than a half hour. And then the third item, one which many of you are here to listen to and to participate in, is a discussion about White's Ferry. Um, and so if you do the math, we'll probably pick that one up um, in the next hour and a half or so, um, possibly sooner, depending on those conversations. Um, I welcome uh, more colleagues, Council Member uh, Fani Gonzalez, Council Vice President Friedson, uh, also in the audience for the White's Ferry conversation. Um, we have two delegates from District 15, uh, Delegate David Fraser Hidalgo and Delegate uh, Linda Foley. Welcome. Um, but first, let's talk about parking lot districts. Um, the PLDs is something that I have wanted to talk a lot more about. Uh, since joining the council five years ago or so, uh, because every year during the budget we have a somewhat existential conversation about the parking lot districts and what we do with those funds, where those funds go, how those funds are generated, um, and it is a system a program that was uh, conceived a few decades ago, and as we start rethinking some of our central business districts, as people rethink driving to those central business districts with more people walking, taking public transportation, uh, and other forms of transit, uh, for more other forms of transportation, um, I think it's important to, to have a conversation about the parking lot districts and also the important things that they fund. Um, and so uh, not seeing any comments from colleagues, I'll turn it over to Dr. Orlin, who knows a thing or two about the PLDs. Uh, I've forgotten more than I know, but thank you anyway. Um, first of all, I'd like to turn it over to Director Conklin and to uh, uh, Division of Parking Management Chief Joe's Tamana to introduce the staff who are here. And then Mr. Tamana is going to give a brief PowerPoint presentation uh, before I go through the packet. Fantastic. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Joe's Tamana, and I'm the Division Chief for the Division of Parking with MCDOT. And with us today is most of our management team, we have uh, Adrian Labor, who's our Chief of Engineering, Scott Reinman, who's our Chief of Operations, and Jeremy Souther, who's our Chief of Management and Administrative Services. We are in process of hiring uh, one of our uh, Chiefs for Financial Management, and that should be done by uh, uh, next month. So with that, we can go straight probably to the presentation. This will be brief. Is it going to come up? OK, this is uh, a quick presentation just summarizing what we do in the Division of Parking, how we're organized, the various functions uh, that we carry out. Next slide, please. Uh, we manage, operate, and maintain about 22,500 paid parking spaces countywide. And uh, those parking spaces are spread out across three parking lot districts, Bethesda, Silver Spring, and Wheaton. We also manage parking, paid parking, in three transportation management districts that are outside of the PLDs. Uh, that's in North Bethesda, the Great Seneca Science Corridor, and which is Shady Grove area, and also the Friendship Heights Transportation Management Districts. Most of our parking spaces are off street. Our facilities are 21 garages, 19 lots, and 3,870 on street spaces. As you can see, our on street inventory is relatively small. Most of our parking spaces are in the garages and lots. In addition to managing all of these paid parking spaces, we also do the permit parking sales for RPP, residential permit parking, and also the enforcement for uh, residential permit parking. We assist other divisions in MCDOT, the transit division with park and ride lot maintenance and also transit center maintenance. 
Uh, so those are some of the functions. We also do some employee parking uh, management in the EOB and COB and in the Wheaton Core too. So those are some of the functions that we carry out. Um, and to the right, I have the breakdown in charts of the spaces and also where those spaces lie. Almost 90 some percent of the spaces are in the parking lot districts. So primarily we are in Silver Spring and Bethesda and then uh, Wheaton and then the other spaces outside of that. Next slide, please. This is a overview of the various sections that we have in the Division of Parking and the major functions that are carried out in these divisions. I'll start with parking operations, where primarily a lot of our functions are carried out. Security services, they patrol our facilities, enforcement, uh, citation processing, that is collection, uh, collection of fine revenue, court hearings, things like that. Garage management, which is cashier services, uh, like the COB, visitor parking. Uh, there's a cashier that sits there and manages that, so those services. Uh, repairs and maintenance of our parking meter, that's our payment infrastructure. And also revenue collection, that is the fee revenue collection. Uh, the next section is our engineering and capital project management section. That's primarily two functions. One is the capital improvement projects that is carried out by the capital project management section. And then the second is maintenance, the maintenance of all the parking garages, all the parking lots and services that go with that. Uh, we have a relatively robust financial management section being an enterprise fund in fact, three enterprise funds, we have to maintain uh, accounting for each of the PLDs, and that's what we do uh, to make sure that the funds are put into the right parking lot district and enterprise fund. We do budget, accounts payable, accounts receivable, audits, and accounting and financial reporting. Uh, and finally, the administrative and management section, a uh, management services section where we do planning, when we uh, roll out new technologies like pay by sell or new payment systems, we go through a planning process. We also do demand studies that look into the future every few years. All of that's done within this planning function. Uh, we have a lot of technology that we utilize with payment technologies and uh, everything else that goes with parking in the background. There's a lot of uh, IT <coughs> infrastructure that needs to be maintained, so we have uh, some IT uh, needs, customer service. We take all of our calls, respond to uh, all of our uh, written correspondence. It does not go to 311. It comes directly to us because it is uh, fairly detailed and requires access to proprietary systems to, to gain uh, more information on the cases. And finally, property uh, development. We do own some parking lots and are occasionally part of joint uh, ventures or uh, par public-private partnerships where we leverage these parking lots for mixed-use developments. So that's kind of a large overview of how the division is set up and all the major functions uh, that we carry out. Um, next slide, I'd like to also mention that almost 40 to 55 percent of our budget, of our operating budget, is contracted services. So a lot of the services that we provide are not provided by our staff directly. We contract out for these services. Uh, some of the major ones are janitorial, security, enforcement, citation processing, uh, permit, uh, sorry, parking permits or media sales. We have two sales stores, one in Silver Spring in the uh, Town Square garage and one in Bethesda in the Cheltenham garage. And we do garage management, revenue collection, uh, electrical maintenance, elevator maintenance, pay system maintenance, uh, credit card processing and utilities. Again, this, this is about 55% of our operating budget. Just to provide some background on our actual operating expenditures over the years. This is going back from FY15 all the way to FY23. Um, the bars represent the total operating expenditures and the lines. The blue line is our personnel cost and the red line is our operating expenditures. And you can see over the years 
We have been trending down in our operating expenditures, several reasons for that. Uh, some of it is improvements in technology, uh, efficiencies that we've gained with uh, things like installing LED lights that reduce our utility costs. Um, but there's also been other things that we've, especially as we got into COVID, uh, we had to reduce our operating expenditures to keep within the uh, cash flow needs for the fund balances. So you're seeing some of that starting to come back. If you look at FY23, we're starting to trend back up a little bit as we restore some of those services. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide really is our capital expenditure trends. These are, again, actuals going back from FY16 till now. Uh, these are just the renovation CIPs. So these are the projects that are managed by the engineering uh, and capital project management team. And this is, uh, for all three PLDs, is the bars, and each individual PLD is also represented by lines. But you can see, starting FY20, once COVID hit, that infrastructure improvement and maintenance uh, investment has gone down significantly. Uh, we're starting to get that back up again uh, this year in FY24, and we hope to do that moving forward, too. A couple of quick slides on uh, why why it is important. So we, as we went into the uh, COVID pandemic and recovered from that, we, we had to make several cuts to our capital improvement uh, projects. But there are some critical deferred capital needs that we do need to, to pay attention to, especially things that affect life safety systems. Uh, what I have pictures there are pictures of car fires that have occurred in our garages, recent ones, um, that these things happen from time to time, and we have to make sure that we do have the infrastructure uh, to, to have fire alarms that, that are uh, functional, to have uh, fire suppression systems that are functional, to have air quality systems that are functional. This is especially critical as we go into underground garages because when we're underground, we do need to make sure we get fresh air into the garage and we get the exhaust and fumes out of the garage. So it is important that we invest back into these facilities as the uh, revenues start turning back up. Some other critical deferred capital needs, elevator repairs. We've had several uh, elevator banks that are out of service uh, over the past year. Uh, water intrusion seems to be a common theme in several of them. So waterproofing and, and making sure that the elevators, and it's not essentially just the elevators, but what happens in that elevator bank in the machine room at the bottom. We go through a annual inspection and certification for all of our elevators. And if they do not pass, we're gonna to have to shut them down. And shutting down too many of the elevators means we have to shut down the facility. So there are critical uh, impacts to service as we go through this. There are also some other maintenance and uh, repair needs that we do have. I have some pictures here of sinkholes, of uh, you know, deck repairs that need to be done that are critical uh, that we plan to fund moving forward and uh, get taken care of. I've listed here uh, a list of unfunded critical capital needs, and again, this is not a comprehensive list, but these are things that we currently have in our program that we've kind of gotten a rough order of magnitude cost for, uh, that we hope to plan for in the future. Uh, right now, it's uh, about 12.1 million in, in uh, the rough order of magnitude cost, but they range from everything, whether it's life safety systems to waterproofing, security improvements, uh, replacement of, uh, uh, you know, um, elevator banks, air quality systems, uh, everything that we would need to have safe and functional uh, facilities that serve our customers. In addition to the critical needs, we also have other deferred capital needs that we haven't really uh, gotten into the details of 
funding out at this point or, or getting a, a rough order of magnitude cost for. But I've listed some of those in here too. Uh, some critical things like safety and security upgrades, uh, making sure that the facilities are clean, safe, painted, bright, have the adequate lighting. Uh, they have systems that work, that provide the service that we want them to, uh, to provide. Invest in payment systems so that as the technologies change, we can uh, provide those services to our customers get more data on the utilization, so having count systems that are there 24-7 in our garages so we know how the facility is being utilized more accurately, not only during the times that we pay, but also the times that we do not require payment. How, how, how the public is really using our systems is, is important, and that provides us great insight into how we should manage our facilities. So that was a quick overview of where we stand with the parking lot districts. I'd be happy to answer any questions or take the questions at a later time. Uh, so I appreciate that, Mr. Tamana. Uh, what you've outlined are the expenses within the PLDs, right, within the, uh, the Department of Transportation. As we know, and we'll broaden out the conversation, that these revenues that are generated also go to, to support other, other county functions. Uh, which is uh, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But while we're on this topic of the the needs of the actual parking garages, just to reiterate one of the last slides you you noted, there are approximately twelve million dollars in repairs that are currently unfunded that need to be made. Is that what you stated? That's correct. We we recently went through and. Uh, looked at all the things that we would like to get done that are critical that need to be funded over the next few years and and uh, made a list of these projects so that we could fund them in the future. And so within the CIP are the projects that are currently there and funded, um, how are they prioritized? So our, our current CIP projects, so the maintenance, the, the smaller maintenance is typically what's covered in our operating budget. When the maintenance becomes more than just a typical maintenance, it's usually done through our renovation CIP, and that's a level of effort. So we, we assume each year that there is a base level of effort that we need to maintain uh, our facilities, and that's what's there for each PLD. In the current cash flow that we had that was approved in 24, we have some projects in addition to that. Uh, so that increased our level of effort uh, for those CIPs a bit more. Those projects are not included in here in this 12.15 million. Okay. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues in a second. I'll just say that over the weekend or over the last 72 hours, uh, I was in Bethesda by the building with the Regional Services Center right next to the Metro and recognized that uh, those elevators are still in disrepair uh, and that also this morning I received an email about the Wayne Avenue garage uh, and recognizing that the elevators that many people use to park and access the library is still in disrepair. Uh, and so people are very mindful of this, people are uh, wanting to be able to uh, get safely in and out of their car to, to get either to the Metro, the Silver Spring Library, or, or other places. Um, and with that, I will turn it over uh, to the uh, District 4 Council Member, Great. Council Member Stewart. Terrific. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, and thank you to the Chair for having this uh, work session today. Um, so in, in the packet, you know, we're looking at uh, declines, particularly in the usage in Silver, the Silver Spring area, which actually makes up the largest portion um, of our parking. And you, you reviewed the capital projects that are not funded. One thing that is was missing from that list that um, I have been asking for and asking the county exec's office for are uh, cameras in stairwells, um, particularly if you look at the trends and look at the the permits um, and the decline in permits, you'll see that we've witnessed a decline in permits very close to the time that um, we have a, a murder occurring in the downtown Silver Spring, one of the downtown Silver Spring garages. Um, in addition to disrepair of elevators, um, many of the constituents who are in that area who 
are choosing to to drive versus take metro other buses or walk to downtown silver spring have spoken to us about concerns about the garages and so i guess i understand the the deferred maintenance and other things that have to happen but um, why are cameras not on that list so we we do have a small budget for safety and security and we continually uh try to replace and add cameras but that is definitely not enough we recently went through an exercise and looked at all of our facilities to, to quantify what it would take uh, to get cameras in all the stairwells and all the levels on all the decks. And it was a significantly large number. We are pursuing some alternate funding uh, to, to fund those needs. And uh, it's not only additional cameras, but it's, it's also replacing the cameras that we currently have. Mm -hmm. We have about 300 cameras that are old analog systems that need to be replaced. They're end of useful life. That That is listed on there as one of our deferred capital needs under safety and security updates, if you look. Oh, I see, I see it now, thank you, and, yes. And replacement cameras, we are, we are aware of that and we would like to do that and fund that too. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a significantly uh, large investment that's needed somewhere about 18 million was the rough order of magnitude to do that uh, in all of our garages. Okay. All right. Um, well, it's, um, I was uh, bought from the county exec's office, um, promised a memo on this uh, some months ago, um, and I was told we would get more information in September. Um, so, you know, residents in the downtown Silver Spring area continually ask about this. And so um, I appreciate it's on the list. Um, I missed it <laughs> on this list, um, seeing the presentation today. And so I would ask that, um, you know, I'm hoping that we, we have this underutilized resource in downtown Silver Spring. We need to do these deferred capital projects. We need to look at the revenue. And if we don't build people's confidence up in using the garages again, we're, get, we're gonna continue this cycle. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that people feel safe, are safe, feel safe in our garages. Um, and so I think that needs to be a focus, particularly in the downtown Silver Spring area. I will say this was also compounded when we made the shift um, this summer, um, adding the fee. We were all aware of that. We communicated. Shifting to how people paid was not well rolled out for folks. Um, we, our office did not receive a lot of information that we could share with folks. The first week it happened, uh, people were very confused about um, how to do it. I, I know it's similar systems to what we have in the rest of the county, but it was new for the downtown Silver Spring area. And I will say that has compounded um, people's um, reluctance to park in our garages, unfortunately. Um, so just to, to say that there, there were some concerns before, and then with this transition over the summer, people got very frustrated. Uh, we heard a lot um, from residents about it. Um, and so that's kind of created this compounding of um, people not necessarily wanting to use the garages um, as much. Um, and that has an impact on our downtown because for folks who can't take buses or transit or walk, they may decide then not to visit our downtown area. Um, or I, can I continue? Is that, yeah, uh, I have one other yes, area. I'm, yes. I'm, I wanted to also bring up um, the permitting parking. Um, and I know, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Orland, for getting the numbers and for uh, the staff for providing them. I know we do the monthly uh, permitting parking, um, but we're also facing, because of Purple Line construction and other things in downtown Silver Spring, constraints on our on-street parking. Um, and we have some apartments where parking is limited and we all, we support, <laughs> you know, uh, development near transit. Um, but this is, this is causing some tensions because of the purple line constructions and other things. And again, looking at how we can increase revenues, is there any openness from the department to look at 
in uh, other permitting um, other than just monthly? Is there, could we do yearly permitting? Um, some of the small businesses have requested being able to do um, park, permit parking in the garages for their employees. But doing a month, you know, having to renew and doing it monthly is a, is a lot. So are there ways that we could work with our businesses, not individualized to each business, but have some type of either yearly or business permit parking so that employees are not parking on the street, but using what are the empty spaces in our lots. Um, I think this could encourage more people um, to be getting permitted parking and to using the lots, and I think more people using the lots, people see it more, and then we'll encourage others to, to use the lots more. A absolutely, so we do do some annual permits already for uh, departments, but uh, again, there, there are pros and cons, cons to everything. So when you give out an annual permit and somebody loses their permit one month in, it becomes an issue. So, so but, but we are willing to work with any businesses. We also have programs uh, with our pay-by-sell vendors where they can set up business accounts so you don't even need to have a permit you can electronically, the business can manage all of their employees, and some businesses do this. Uh, we have Whole Foods in Silver Spring that does that, Marriott in Silver Spring that does that too, where they set up a business account, they pay for the employee parking through that system, and uh, we see the revenue, we get their information on the plates that are registered, and we can enforce accordingly. Great, and I, I think it would be really great if we could work together and help our small businesses, um, not just the Whole Foods and larger like Marriott, because um, our small businesses don't know about this uh, ability to do that. And so I think it would be really helpful. Um, and if you get on the website, it's not obvious either that these um, systems are available. So perhaps we can take it offline, because I know there are a lot of people here for other items on our agenda today. Um, but I, I do think looking at how we can, um, if there are permit systems already in place, how we can make sure residents and our small businesses are aware of them and we make them as easy to use as possible. So we can take this conversation offline. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Balcom and then Councilmember Fani Gonzalez. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here today. I, I think we have two issues that we're talking about in, in, in the packet. One is the deferred construction, and then the other is the long-term sustainable uh, financial st sustainability of the PLDs. And they, of course, they go hand in hand. So can you just talk a little bit about the, the history of how these uh, uh, maintenance projects are funded? Specifically, we've got ongoing maintenance. But then we've got um, these significant capital projects. Which ones are funded out of the revenue, and which ones can we and should we be bonding? Uh, well, they all need to be funded out of PLD resources. Uh, most of the CIP is funded with current revenue from that parking district, which is cash. It's the same money it's used in the operating budget. Uh, the distinction between that kind of work and what's in the operating budget really is more, is it really short term, like day to day, or is it um, uh, uh, basically longer term uh, kind of improvements? Um, the, we've been very esteemous as a county to use PLD funds to bond for bonding purposes, because the bonds are not general obligation bonds. They're parking lot district bonds. In fact, they're parking lot district bonds from that parking district, not from all of them. Um, and so currently there's only three debt issues that are out there that we would be paying back. One is for Garage 49, the Metropolitan Building, which has got to be very old. It's got to be near completed the debt service on that. Uh, one was from Garage 11 from about 10, 15 years ago when there was a major renovation done then. And then one more recently for Garage 31, which is the one at the intersection of, uh, of uh, Woodmont Avenue and Bethesda Avenue. Um, and one of the things I suggested is that perhaps we don't need to be as abstemious as we have been, uh, or possibly we're positively ga uh, Gaithersburgian in this respect. Uh, we seem to like want to avoid debt wherever we can. Uh, and there may be some opportunities, it, it may be make more sense to actually fund some of this with bonds, because um, if we're delaying these renovations to the point 
where they become much more expensive projects five, ten years down the road, then yes, if we, if we are issuing bonds, we have to pay debt service. It's strung out over a number of years. Uh, and in the aggregate, you're going to end up paying more because you're paying principal and interest. However, uh, you may be saving money because the improvement that you're doing sooner is going to be a lot less than the improvement you'd have to do later. Secondly, I'd argue that actually debt financing is actually more equitable because if you're doing an improvement which that lasts for 20 years, uh, then the people who are benefiting from it should all pay um, towards this. And I, and rather, I also, rather than having the people who are paying right now pay for it and then the next 19 years they don't. So I uh, don't want to give a number out. It really depends on the financials for each district. But there may be some improvements that we're not doing now, which we could use PLD funds, bonds for. Uh, and then we can actually get more work done. But I think, uh, thank you. And I think that uh, Councilmember Stewart's point about um, it's it's going to be a downward spiral if the if the parking lot if the parking garages aren't seen as safe or if they're in disrepair, fewer and fewer people are going to use it, which we have less revenue, and um, and and also we have to look at uh, and I think that. Uh, you mentioned a couple things in the in the packet about um, who benefits from the the parking lot districts uh, and the revenue if if we ha if the if the garages are supporting our town center uh, the, the Silver Spring Bethesda Wheaton they're a critical part of the the economic sustainability of the area. And especially when you look at safety, and so perhaps that's something that we need to look at bonding for. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez, and then Vice, I'm sorry, Director Conklin. I just wanted to speak a little bit about um, debt related to the parking facilities. Um, yes, there may be advantages to it. There are also significant handicaps from doing it. We've seen this in trying to accomplish redevelopment projects in Bethesda, which has had debt for, the long, for a long period of time. The other two have not. And there are serious constraints on the flexibility of changing the number of parking spaces in the PLDs once you've issued debt against them. And the debt for these facilities tends to be higher cost than the county debt otherwise. And we also have bond reserve accounts um, that have to be funded. Um, so it does create more revenue pressures to have that debt service in place. There's usually coverage ratios, revenue to debt service. So there's there are a lot of complications with it. So. The, the PLDs that haven't had that debt service, we've had a lot more flexibility in how to work in them. That doesn't mean anything that Dr. Orland said is wrong. It's just there are two sides to the coin with the debt issuance. Can I, can I follow up on that? Thank you. Can I follow up? So something like the cameras, security cameras. They may not be eligible for debt. No. They may not yeah. be eligible. Yeah, they have to. Whatever you pay with bonds, you have, it has to last for at least 20 years. Thank you. So the technology is out of the question. They're really talking about major renovations, which will last for 20 years or more. Councilmember Fonny Gonzalez. Good morning. Uh, going along the same questioning that we have had from our colleagues, um, yesterday I was in the fabulous Wheaton Arts Parade, and we had a table there for the whole event. And the number one complaint that I was getting from people was safety in the garage. Okay, and, and you know, not enough lighting, uh, not clean enough, the cameras issue, I mean, it's, it's happening across the county, across the nation, I know that. Um, but also, it caught my attention, so that's one thing that I wanted to raise, and I know that Wheaton has done much better in the parking, raising money through the parking lots, which is awesome. Hopefully, we'll continue on that same trend. Um, it caught my attention that in your PowerPoint, which is not part of the package, and I would like to please have a copy, you, on the critical needs in the garages, you don't talk about Wheaton. You were highlighting Silver Spring and Bethesda, and I know that there are issues in the, in the Wheaton garages, as explained by several people yesterday in the Wheaton Arts Parade um, table that I have. So. How can I get it? And I know this conversation is about expenses through the garages and in Wheaton, well, we're special because we get more money from the general funds. Um, but I, I will not, and we also get money from the parking lots, obviously. But I, I would like to get a list as you have it for the other two districts. And I don't know why you didn't highlight it here. Um, sure, it's, it's, it's not that, uh, the reason is that, you know, we, we hadn't gotten time. This, these are critical unfunded unfunded items 
in Wheaton, we really have only two facilities, and they're kind of rolled up into the deferred capital needs at this point for okay. all, all the PLDs. Uh, we currently do not really have elevators that are out in, in Wheaton, but I do recognize that there are other improvements that we do need to make in Wheaton to keep it safe and uh, functioning and have lighting and all of that in place. So yes, those are rolled up into the deferred capital needs. They're just not listed as critical that we need to address right away. Is there a way that we can get a list of all the needs in Bethesda, in Silver Spring, in Wheaton? all separated so one by the time we deal with the budget we know what issues we have in each of the, the three uh you say i can't i can't just generalize and tell people who live in wheaton that you know this was happening but i don't have anything and i need to see data speaks right i need to see numbers how much are we talking about in in each of the three these districts um so we can make a, a sound decision moving forward Absolutely. We, we do have a list of projects that we maintain for all of the PLDs, and, and we can categorize them and get some rough numbers onto them and That'll be provide great. that. Thank you so much for your work. That's it. Uh, thank you. Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's a really important question uh, and issue that we're having. As you know, I spent a lot of time dealing with PLD-related issues as the Bethesda uh, council member. Um, and just want to note a couple things that have already been said. I don't want to go too much into it, but the, the elevator issues are huge issues. As you know, the Metropolitan Garage has been an ongoing issue. We've uh, solicited state support uh, f for that. It's an ongoing issue and concern. It's about accessibility and safety. Uh, you know, the Regional Service Center there, for instance, serves a lot of our older adult population, and being able to access in and out of uh, that facility is, you know, requires. Uh, an elevator to not have it be accessible is, is a real ongoing challenge. I know you already know that, but I just thought it was important uh, to note. And the, the cameras piece, the safety is a huge issue. Uh, it's particularly important in Silver Spring, given everything that we have unfortunately experienced uh, recently, but it's, it's important everywhere. And you're hearing it in Wheaton, you hear it in Bethesda, you hear it everywhere. So I, I, I don't, you know, I, I want to make sure that we lift up Silver Spring, but note the, the broader concern of, of, of safety. If we want people to use these facilities, we have to make sure that they feel safe uh, when they do it. And the presence of a camera does make people feel safer. Lighting and, and cameras are a huge, uh, you know, a huge security blanket just for, for, you know, not necessarily only to make you safer, but also to make you feel safer, both of which are important. Uh, for folks uh, to, to use it. You're welcome to respond. To I, that I just like. wanted to make sure it was clear that the, the parking division did do the comprehensive assessment since the budget action this summer and is reviewing those with MCPD and the public safety cluster to figure out what the best way to prioritize and fund that camera system is. Got so it. there has okay. been progress Th on that. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of lift that up. Um, on the, the financial dynamics of this, I think this is the most important piece. So our urban districts, I know this is the Transportation Committee, not the Economic Development Committee, but since we have the Economic Development Chair here, uh, our urban districts are the lifeblood of the county's economy. I mean, everything that, that we, uh, uh, you know, are moving towards in terms of, you know, an urbanizing county requires the strength, the success of these areas. And they are, in many ways, the places where we're generating a lot of the tax revenue that we need for other parts of the county as well. So they're really important. We have a, a bit of a backwards dynamic here where uh, part of the main infrastructure that we're funding in urban districts are through parking, which requires cars, as almost every other policy that we are undertaking in the county is to reduce single occupancy vehicles and non-auto non driver mode share. So I, I do think at a certain point we're going to have to come to grips with these two discrepancies, you know, this dichotomy here where on the one hand, the infrastructure of these key areas in the county is being financed by something that we are actively trying to reduce. And at, at a certain point, you know, I don't think it's tomorrow, uh, but there is a reckoning and we, and we see the, the vulnerability that we have just by the data that you've shown on COVID where there was a gutting of the revenue 
for you know which which threatened the entire model of the parking lot uh, district and you know while i don't think that uh, you know the, the switch turns on and off like covid did that was an unnatural disruption uh, in in many ways it did show part of where the trend is heading and the danger uh, that this has so i, I you know I, I, we're not here to do that today necessarily but at a certain point we we're going to have to grapple with that grim reality economically and fiscally uh, that this is not a sustainable model for the next 50 years and planning for the next 50 years has to start today or tomorrow or next week it can't start in uh in in in, in, in 20 uh years from now you mentioned the three garages uh dr Orland, uh garage 49 garage 11 garage 30 uh one those are the only three with outstanding debt that's correct and how many years of debt are left on those three uh, i don't recall uh, 11 i mean 49 has to be almost done but yeah so they're all refinanced and they should be done by 2032 the current payment schedule is to repay them by 2032. okay so nine years so i, I think we have to decide what happens then and, and you mentioned bonding I mean, i think bonding is important i think we should be bonding a lot of these projects particularly the major infrastructure projects i think the question is what are they bonded through because we we do have to be sensitive here to the fact that we are making policy decisions important policy decisions to move away from certain things and if we are relying on the revenue from things that we are intentionally diminishing uh, from a you know from the standpoint of a, of, of a revenue standpoint you know that might not be a sustainable model uh, either so you know and, and then the the related piece of that which i think is important is a lot of the decision that we're making in our downtowns relating to redevelopment and other things require to give up parking spaces and it's hard to do that if we're relying on the revenue from those parking spaces and you know farm women's market is an example where i appreciate uh, uh mr conklin and, and the department's willingness to give up a significant number of parking spaces in order to make that deal work but i know that that is not a normal policy decision that is made largely because of the revenue for the parking lot district and also because of some of the businesses and other needs in the community but if we're going to start moving in that direction you know we really do have to think about the the revenue model and and how we have based these uh decisions on and i think that's going to be an important conversation as we move forward if i could yeah, jump in so you're absolutely right on all counts vice president Friedson, and that's why we're having this conversation that's why i've wanted this conversation for five years because every time we go into the budget we are trying to figure this out and the connection that you made between the parking lot districts and the urban districts uh, is exactly why uh, council uh, member Fani Gonzalez as chair of the Economic Development Committee, which now has jurisdiction over urban districts this year, because that committee will be having another conversation about urban districts in a few weeks. And before we have that conversation, we wanted to have this conversation. So they are all yep. tied. I, I, You're correct. I appreciate that. And if I could then now turn to Dr. Orland to share with us his thoughts mm -hmm. on the funding piece. Sure. Um, uh, you know, the packet has various ideas. Um, they're all interesting for various reasons. Uh, you know, just setting expectation, no decisions are being made today. Right. Um, this is a complex knot to untie uh, as we look for the next decade and two uh, and want to make sure that our urban districts and our downtown areas uh, are walkable and have all the resources. So, Dr. Orland. Uh, thank you. And just setting the stage for the options, uh, it, in the longer term, the parking lot districts as, as it exists today are not particularly sustainable. Um, the the forecast of in the fiscal plan that was just recently uh, based on the budget that was just recently adopted um, shows that the percentage of uh, next year's operating budget and, and debt service uh, uh, that is the ratio between the the ending reserve and the next year's operating uh, cost and debt service is hovering around 25%, it's a little lower than 25%, some areas are a little higher than 25% than others, except Wheaton's doing really well in the next few years because of the opening of the new garage, but it too is, is dropping, um, and which is actually different than what happened in the last few years. The last few years we've been actually 20%, 15%, some years in single digits, so this is really, uh, it's a good sign. And that was how 
the council, uh, this committee and the council was able to actually add money to the renovation budgets in Silver Spring and Wheaton, uh, Silver Spring and Bethesda, sorry, uh, last May, without uh, uh, really doing damage to that percentage. Uh, nevertheless, a couple things. First of all, that fiscal plan assumes there's going to be another major revenue increase uh, in three years, um, in FY28 and FY29, uh, $750,000 more revenue each in Bethesda and Silver Spring, and $300,000 uh, in in Wheaton in FY28 and again 29. Uh, no, uh, no measure has been identified as to what will bring that about, but it pretty much can only happen with increasing fees again unless you increase hours, and there's not many more hours you can increase without going to Sundays. Um, and there's always so many more uh, lots that we can actually sell off for redevelopment, um, uh, because uh, we've done a lot to a certain degree now, we maybe one or two more opportunities like that, but uh, that's, that's only a one-time influx of money, it's not something which continues over time. So um, with that, I mentioned one about the bond funding. Um, the next three are actually more difficult. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, um, actually I, I proposed this, uh, a charter amendment which would exempt small area ad valorem property taxes from the countywide property tax cap. I was around in 1990. The reason for that property tax cap had nothing to do with the parking lot districts, had nothing to do with the urban districts, had nothing to do with, well, a couple of these other things didn't even exist then. It had to do with the countywide property tax that most residents were paying. And that was put together very, very quickly. It was an election uh, coming up, uh, and they exempted only development districts that didn't think about parking lot districts or urban districts, um, which in the case of parking lot districts, as you know, you pay that tax, or you used to pay that tax if you didn't provide your zoning required parking. It was an option. You either provide the parking that's required in the zoning, or you pay the annual tax to have the government basically build and maintain and operate those garages. Uh, and we had that tax in effect for about 65 years, uh, and then we uh, got rid of it about, I don't remember now, eight and ten years ago or so. Um, and actually, several changes were made. Um, but uh, Part of the reason why uh, it was done was basically to help the property tax cap situation. So one thought is to have a charter amendment which would exempt those, which would allow the, the, the constituents and then of course the council in the end to make a decision not bound by this countywide cap as to what the taxes ought to be in Bethesda, Silver Spring, and Wheaton for the parking lot districts and perhaps the urban districts too. It could be that the urban district constituents want to, are willing to pay more in the way of a tax to be able to provide more urban district services. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's one option that you could think about doing. Um, and it's also, uh, it also increasing the park lot district taxes an equity issue. Because again, the original idea, which was actually groundbreaking at the time in 1948 and 1950 when these things were created, was that rather than have every individual business provide their own parking, let's have shared parking. Let's have everyone pay into, if we wanted to, pay into a fund which then the county would provide shared parking, and as a result, there would be less parking, much more cost effective than it would be if every individual business had their own parking. Um, but now that we don't have that tax, effectively you've got some properties that are paying for their own parking, not just building it, but also maintaining and operating, and others aren't paying a thing, and that doesn't seem very fair. Uh, another idea is to change the taxes from ad valorem to uh, some base basis which is not at the floor, like a per square foot, uh, uh, or by land use type, like the business improvement districts, or I guess by way that Friendship Heights uh, is, is, being, is being funded, the way the urban district. Um, that has to be checked legally as to whether or not that is a workaround, but certainly the property tax cap that's, that's in effect now deals with ad valorem taxes. Now, and a third is to phase out the PLD uh, transfers to the urban districts or to reduce them substantially. And again, this is more like an equity issue. Who benefits from urban districts? Who are, the primary, who are the primary beneficiaries? I would say it's the businesses and the residents of the urban districts. It isn't necessarily just people who arrive there by car. Uh, there are people who arrive there by walking, arrive there by transit, they're not paying. Um, how is that equitable? So again, I don't have an answer for this one, but it's something that I think you should really think about. Um, and maybe the, this, the, the second, or the, the first option I just mentioned, this last conversation, about ha freeing up the urban districts as well as the parking districts from this property tax cap would make a difference there. And I'm sure there are other option, ideas out there. These are the ones I could come up with in the last week or so, but uh, again, tossing them out there for 
much further discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Orlin. This is, uh, as you noted, this is not an exclusive uh, list of ideas. They're ones that um, uh, that you're sharing uh, for public consideration. And as all of us have our ears on the ground, uh, we've been talking with residents who are concerned about a variety of different um, concerns within the central business districts and within the parking structures themselves. Um, these are conversation starters. Some of them I'm not sure will go very far. Uh, but I appreciate you putting them out there. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I think we need to reconcile with is, as, as has been noted by my colleagues, recognizing the direction that we as a community are going in and the uh, diminishing return from parking structures, um, which is a conversation that's not going away. You know, uh, I, we regularly here in the council approve uh, Department of Transportation requests to turn over uh, parking structures, parking lots in particular, in some of our downtown areas. So by our, by our own actions, we are diminishing our stock. And so the ideas that you have recommended here, um, we will um, ruminate on um, and we'll, we'll have another conversation. Uh, but as has been noted, it's really important to start this conversation. Uh, and then when it transitions over to the Economic Development Committee in a week or two, is that? In two weeks' time, uh, we'll be able to carry some of these ideas over. Um, any colleagues have any other thoughts? Close out this conversation. Just yeah. Just yeah. I just wanted to say one thing um, since we were talking about the safety um, of the garages and to note that we do have our Jacob Newman, our regional services person with us today. And I, I would be remiss if I did not note the excellent work that our red shirts are doing and our, our police department is doing in downtown Silver Spring. So as we're talking about these longer term issues and how we're going to ensure that we get the cameras installed and keep up with the maintenance. Um, right now, I just want to note the excellent work that um, the red shirts are doing. If someone needs any assistance, um, if it's late at night and would like an escort uh, to their car, and the work of our police department there. So um, just wanted to note that as we were closing out this conversation. Vice President Friedson. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate all of the options uh, that Dr. Orlin, you have put forward. I just, for the Economic Development Committee meeting, I would just hope, because I'm not sure I totally agree with the suggestion that um, only people who live or overwhelmingly people who live in urban districts benefit from urban districts. And I just, as part of that conversation, I would suggest looking at the amount of revenue that we generate in property taxes and income taxes uh, and looking at the overwhelmingly positive benefits to the entire county that urban districts have and i really think that that should be centered as part of the conversation because that that is a big part of it and i don't think that we should rely so much on urban districts uh, as uh, we are but then suggest that uh, only the people in the urban district should bear uh, the, the 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 costs uh, for for them as well uh, because having thriving urban districts jobs amenities etc it's a reason why some people live a little farther away from an urban district because they don't want to be in the center of everything perhaps but they want it to be close by within 15 minutes of uh or, or so of of uh of where they live so i just wanted to note that i'll, I'll yield back councilmember balcom so i think an important part of the discussion is if we look at the occupancy of the garages and we see a significant decline um i would be interested and in, i don't know how we would gather this information is um, are, are people coming uh, to the Silver Spring and Bethesda a different way other than coming and driving and parking in the garages? Because I think that those, that would be too, to, to follow up on uh, Council Member Friedson's point, uh, I, I go to both Bethesda and Silver Spring and rely on the garages when I get there. So I think it's important to find out um, are people coming or or have has the presence just been um, diminished of people coming to those areas? I don't know if we have that data. We have some data that gives us some clues about it. The, the num number of parkers that are there for a long duration is dramatically down. So that seems to indicate that the occup occupancy of office space and commuting 
using the parking lot districts is lower and hasn't recovered as quickly as the use for shopping, dining, or other short-term visits to the PLDs. Yeah, so as we move into economic development, I think that's important to, to if we can uh, guess or, or make educated guesses as to uh, retail versus commercial, I think that would be important to the discussion. Uh, last comment on this, Vice President Friedson. Yeah, I th also think it would be helpful to follow up and look at the capacity by garage because my experience in urban districts is that capacity is not created equally. And if you look at certain garages are generally full at peak times for retail use at the very least, and other garages are virtually empty or there are multiple you know, floors of garages uh, that are empty and there's a lack of you know, sharing of the assets uh, in a even uh, way. And I think we need to do a better job of utilizing the assets you know with policy decisions and advertising and you know other dynamics in order to, to to better do that as well and i think that's an area where we could improve i know there have been proposals to look at that in terms of variable variable pricing and other dynamics and and there are ways to do that but i do think that's a key area uh, as we move forward because when we look at the capacity for an entire urban district it's very, very different uh, based on the garage that you are looking at, from my experience, and that's true in all of the urban districts. So I'll yield back. Thanks. That's okay. actually happening now to a certain degree. Um, th th when you approved the parking fee rates last May, uh, those are maximum rates, and what DOT does is it charges less than that in those garages and those lots, which are uh, not as as uh, subscribed as the, as, the, as the ones that are. Th there is a difference. They're, they're trying to do it through the pricing mechanism. Very good. Uh, this conversation will definitely continue not only here in TNE but also in Economic Development Committee as well, and pr uh, presume we'll have a joint committee at some point thereafter. Um, thank you, Mr. Tamana, for the for the presentation. Um, we are now going to uh, actually jump ahead. We're going to uh, skip item number two for the time being, and we're going to go to the White's Ferry conversation due to some folks' uh, schedules. Um, and the interest in that conversation as well. Uh, so I'd invite up Director Conklin's already here, President Brown, Mr. Hoeing, um, our delegates, if you'd like to join us. And then we have some guests who are joining us virtually. And so if they want to prepare themselves, uh, Ms. Devlin and Mr. Kuhn. I'm just saying that I'm on here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Slippy. We, we see you and hear you. Thank you very much. We'll get to you in a few moments. Okay, everybody. So the reason I wanted to have this conversation is because White's Ferry has been a topic of public conversation for the last three years since it closed. You know, for those who are unfamiliar with the historical importance of White's Ferry, um, it has transported people across the Potomac River since 1786. And up until um, it stopped its service, there were nearly 800 trips every single day, getting people to work, to shopping, to visiting family. Um, and it also provided uh, relief for meeting our climate goals because now that it's been closed people have had to drive dozens and dozens of miles out of their way every single day to meet their daily needs and the public has asked what we in montgomery county are doing and it is complicated to say the least uh, we are dealing with uh, private landowners on Mer maryland side we're dealing with private landowners on Virginia side, and so it has become an interstate conversation. And I appreciate everybody who's joining us today uh, for their work on this, and those who are joining us virtually as well. Um, and so before we turn over to our guests, I, I wanna turn it over to the District 2 Council Member and then turn it over uh, to the uh, Vice President who previously represented this district to make some opening comments. Council Member Balcom. Uh, <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, and thank you all for coming, and thank you, Council President, for bringing us all together. Uh, we're going on three years, and it's it's been going on so long that you've got two council members uh, that have spanned the uh, the tenure of both uh, Council Pre uh, Vice President Friedson and myself, and I think that we've had lots of conversations about what can happen, what must happen, what should happen. We need to get the ferry open. It's such a critical point of economic development. And so for people who don't have a thorough understanding of the importance of the ferry in Poolsville, um, it, it's not just a, a tourist attraction that you can take every couple years to go out and have this quaint ride across the Potomac. It is a vital, vital transportation infrastructure that we need to get open. So um, thank you for being here today. We want to know from you specifically what the county can do to move this along. So thank you. Uh, Vice th President Friedson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. President. I uh, really appreciate it. I'll just <laughs> echo everything that my colleague has said. Uh, the county has been willing, ready, and able to step up and do whatever is needed from the beginning. And the town of Poolsville has been there right from the beginning and uh, with the Fair Access Committee and, and others. And Delegate Fraser Hidalgo, who is here, and I think we'll hear from in a, a few minutes, uh, has been at the forefront of this, along with Linda Foley, who's also here in the District 15 team. Uh, this really highlights the challenge that we have when we have a critical transportation infrastructure that is controlled by private entities and private entities that aren't willing to work with each other and a dispute that has gone on for way too long. And I appreciate the fact that they are here uh, and are going to share their views. Uh, but we have to get the ferry open yesterday. It's completely unacceptable, the situation that we're in right now. Thousands and thousands of residents are being harmed. Hundreds of businesses are being hurt. The economic dynamics of Western Montgomery County are impacted by this. Virginia is impacted by this. In Loudoun County, we are all impacted by this. And we need to figure out a way to put aside personal dynamics and do what is needed for the good of the broader community and for our entire region, something that uh, we have relied on. And I think we really need to do some soul searching here as we move forward uh, to really think about the challenges when we allow for public needs to be subjected to the whims of private entities. And I hope that the private entities who are here with us today uh, will really think through and uh, determine what they can do to help us to move this forward. And you know, from the New Year's Eve virtual meeting that we had in the middle of the pandemic in uh, 2020, uh, you know, a few days after uh, the initial closure uh, occurred, where Delegate Fraser Hidalgo and I uh, were on with uh, the town of Poolsville uh, until now, um, this seemed like it was a a weeks long or maybe a months long problem. It has been a years long problem and we are almost in the exact same position today uh, as we were then, uh, which should shame and embarrass all of us. And so I'm glad that we're having this conversation and we're doing it here in public and I hope uh, that everybody who is involved in this has the same level of commitment that the, the county has demonstrated and the District 15 delegation and the town of Poolsville uh, have demonstrated because we absolutely need to get this done and we need to get, get it done now. Uh, thank you uh, to my colleagues for their work on this issue and for those comments and so now we're going to start the conversation. I'll start with uh, Director Conklin to share his perspective on what we've been doing. And what yes, good morning. Um, I've put together a presentation that outlines the activities that have taken place trying to get the ferry restarted and some sense of the timeline uh, related to the ferry closure. These are the perspectives of this issue from our point of view is an agency that's been trying to solve this problem. Others who are involved with this may have a different point of view and I expect you'll hear from them if that's the case after our presentation during their remarks. So we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to go quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for the discussion. Thank you. So we're going to cover today the ferry location, uh, the land interests of issue, the timeline of between 2020, actually starting before 2020, 
uh, and today and then the solutions that are still possible but none of which have had the effect we want so far. So White's Ferry is at the western part of Montgomery County just outside the town of Leesburg, creates that connection between a more heavily developed area in Virginia and uh, the agricultural reserve in the town of Poolsville in Maryland. The uh, ferry is a cable operated ferry. On the Maryland side are all the support facilities for the ferry, store, maintenance, tie downs. Uh, the Virginia side has a ramp that you can see in blue and that area in blue is actually the area that is in dispute in terms of the ferry operation, that very small area you see in the diagram. Go ahead. Um, uh, on the Virginia side of the river, we've worked with Loudoun County and the Virginia Department of Transportation. Uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation has a fee simple right of way that makes its way to the river's edge and then bends northward. Beyond that, is, it is a prescriptive right of way, meaning that it's maintained for public access by the Virginia Department of Transportation but does not have a defined property interest other than the road itself. And then you see the end of state maintenance is where the ferry landing begins, uh, and that is the area that White's Ferry had used to land the boat, which is on Miss Devlin's property. The ferry was established back in the 1700s as a, as a vital commercial link between the two communities. Uh, the lack of the ferry service has a very substantial negative impact, as been said between nine and $25 million of economic benefit lost by not having this ferry in service. The travel time savings alone uh, that would be realized by the ferry operation are between one and $4 million per year. And there's a great need to get this reopened to rebuild those connections uh, because the alternates are very far from this location, either all the way up to Point of Rocks or down to the American Legion Bridge. There are no other crossing opportunities in that area. And these are findings from the study that Loudoun County and Montgomery County completed a couple years ago. Um, the uh, land issues of interest here, uh, Ms. Devlin uh, is the managing partner of Rockland LLC and controls a large farm on the Virginia side of the river. Uh, the ferry landing is located on that farm. On the Virginia side, uh, Chuck and Stacy Kuhn, I think Chuck is with us, but I can't see him on the screen, um, are the ferry owners on the Maryland side, owned a few acres of land around the ferry. Herb Brown owned it as this dispute uh, unfolded and the ferry stopped operating in 2020. Uh, at one time, there was a condemnation of a ferry landing in uh, Virginia. Uh, the court was not able to substantiate that that ferry landing was this ferry landing. Uh, so that uh, was uh, the finding in that case. And another uh, point of interest is that Montgomery County is precluded by state law from controlling land interests in Virginia. So there have been a lot of people involved in this, a lot of agencies, Montgomery County and Loudoun County were very active in trying to resolve this issue in the early days. Montgomery County stayed active. The town of Bullsville has been act working on this throughout the ferry closure, uh, generating public support for restarting it and encouraging action by the other parties. Virginia Department of Transportation has been asked to be engaged in this in a substantive way, has not. The Maryland Department of Transportation has reached out to their partners uh, at the Virginia Department of Transportation, both in the Hogan administration and more recently in the Moore administration. And you can see by the representation here today that our Maryland elected officials, including some who aren't here today, uh, have been very active in trying to get this resolved. So then in terms of the timeline, again, 18, or 176, I can't read, 1786, the ferry began operation. Uh, a license agreement was established in 1952 that formally allowed the ferry to land on Rockland Farm. There was a flood sometime around 2004 and then improvements were made uh, on the Virginia landing without the permission of the owner. Uh, that uh, started a, a lawsuit uh, that um, Rockland Farm claimed that damage had been done, the terms of the license had been violated, uh, and that was a breach of the agreement which uh, Rockland Farm prevailed in that case. It was settled right around the end of 2020. Uh, and then we learned in late December that the ferry operation was in jeopardy. The cable had broken and White's Ferry uh, had stopped operating at that time. Next slide. In 2021, again, the ferry is closed now. Uh, and as soon as we learned of this, we conferred with the county attorney to understand what the county's options were for getting the ferry restarted. We learned uh, through their investigation that we had very limited options. We couldn't exercise the normal powers that we would in Maryland to restart the ferry. And we began an effort of trying to encourage agreement among the parties. 
Uh, we met with Herb Brown. It was January 6th, believe it or not, the day we met with Herb Brown to understand the history of, of the negotiations between the parties. He relayed everything that he had done and that Rockland Farm had come to the table with at that time and, and that they hadn't been able to resolve those issues and he was interested in selling the ferry at that point. Uh, we initiated a joint study, about $200,000 was invested between Montgomery County and Loudoun County to try to build the justification about the public purpose of the ferry and to give substantiation to Loudoun County's ability to acquire the, fan, uh, the ferry landing through condemnation, which they do have the authority to do. Um, in 2021, February, Mr. Kuhn purchased the ferry uh, from Mr. Brown, and that gave some sense that perhaps a resolution would be possible with new participants in the discussion and a new chance at negotiating a solution. In August 2021, and, and I know this offer was made to other owners before, but we, were, we learned of the offer to allow the ferry to restart if 50 cents per car were paid to Rockland Farm, um, and, and we began to try to consider what options we might have to meet that plan. Next slide. Uh, in 2021 September, the town of Poolsville invited Mr. Kuhn to a public meeting. Uh, he described uh, his efforts and a desire to get the ferry restarted. Um, and then shortly after that, we finished and published the study we had commissioned uh, that we thought gave the substantiation necessary for a public taking of the Virginia landing uh, so that the ferry could be restarted. In November of 2021, the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors met to understand their options. Uh, representatives, the county executive, I believe the then council president and others attended that meeting uh, and Loudoun County elected not to exercise their eminent domain authority at that time, uh, but did agree to try to cooperatively purchase the ferry landing between January and June of or in July of 2022, Loudoun County conducted activities to understand what interests they might acquire from Ms. Devlin, uh, but was not able to present an offer for purchase to Ms. Devlin. In 2022, I met with the two secretaries at a regional transportation forum, encouraged them to get together and try to address and solve this issue at a state to state level, given that the local governments really didn't have the authority, well, our local government, doesn't have the authority to affect the solution. They met following that meeting, and as you heard from the last CP, CTP tour, the secretary was not able to get Virginia uh, to act to solve the problem. In uh, January of 2023, uh, we tried to take a different course of action where Montgomery County tried to broker a joint offer to Ms. Devlin. Uh, we got Loudoun County together with Mr. Kuhn, assembled a, a offer of $200,000 from Montgomery County, $200,000 from Loudoun County, $400,000 from Mr. Kuhn, which I believe was consistent with the previous offers he and Herb Brown had made to acquire the landing. Uh, and I met Ms. with Ms. Devlin and presented that offer to her in January of 2023. In, uh, again, in January 2023, we started uh, to look at acquiring the ferry from Mr. Kuhn, thinking that that might have an impact on the ability to get the ferry restarted. So discussions between Mr. Kuhn and the Montgomery County Revenue Authority uh, began then uh, to see whether if we were able to acquire the ferry, that would change the dynamics. Uh, we explored the 50 cents per car option with Loudoun County and Mr. Kuhn. Neither of those entities were willing to participate in a, in a joint purchase offer along those terms. Uh, we contacted VDOT in 2023 uh, on the advice of Loudoun County that VDOT might be willing to acquire the landing. Uh, so we began discussing that with VDOT. And then in May of 2023, VDOT determined that they were unwilling to start a capital project that would allow them to exercise their eminent domain authority to take the landing and were otherwise disinterested in working cooperatively to acquire the landing, viewing it as a matter for the local government in Loudoun County. In May of 2023, we ceased our discussion of acquisition of the ferry uh, principally because we had no solution on the Virginia side, so it was not beneficial to solving the problem for the county to own the ferry at that point of view because it did not change the dynamics in Virginia. Then in August of 2023, we encouraged Ms. Devlin and Rockland to make counter offers along the terms of the offer that had been provided to her from Loudoun County, the ferry operator in Montgomery County, uh, we have not received any counter offers um, along the lines that were pr uh, provided in our offers to her. Uh, we met with Mr. Kuhn in August of 2023, encouraged him to take a different tact in trying to solve the problem. He said he would provide Rockland Farm with different options. I believe that has happened, but again, those parties can speak to that themselves. 
Um, Rockland and, and Mr. Kuhn engaged in a mediated discussion with a party known to both of them. Also this fall, those discussions, from my understanding, have broken down and there's no solution to be had from that. We offered to hire uh, or provide an independent mediator for the parties at the same time frame that that offer hasn't been adopted by either party. And then in September, we began looking at alternates, saying we are unable to solve this problem with the current parties. What other parties might we be able to solve the problem with? So we've initiated discussion with the National Park Service, which, in, which controls almost all of the Maryland shoreline, and other owners in Virginia, and engaged uh, a ferry operator who has different ideas about how this could work, and those are ongoing. So that's the timeline that gets us to where we are. Now, briefly, the solutions that are available, and I'll, this is very quick, they're A through G. Um, solution A is the private resolution. Between the two parties, at any time, these parties could come to an agreement that would allow the ferry to restart. That hasn't happened so far. But we will do what we can to help that happen. Solution B, we offer joint acquisition by Loudoun from everything that I, or I'm sorry, acquisition by Loudoun or VDOT, they could exercise the authority they have to acquire the site at any time, um, either agreeably or not agreeably as they are uh, able to as local governments and state governments in Virginia. Solution C, joint acquisition along the lines that had been proposed to Ms. Devlin by, Rock, by White's Ferry, Montgomery County, and Loudoun County. All, I think all parties are willing to continue those discussions and make a, an arrangement that would work to let the ferry restart. D, uh, third-party acquisition, some disinterested third party could strike a deal with both Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Devlin and operate the ferry on a fee basis with both of those owners. Nobody has come to the table as a third party, but that is an option. Uh, or that third party could just acquire the interest from Ms. Devlin, but again, nobody has identified themselves as a willing third party. E, 50 cents car paid to Rockland. This could work. Ms. Devlin says she's wanting this. Uh, the current and previous ferry owner were not willing to do this. Uh, Loudoun County was not willing to acquire the interest on an ongoing payment basis, and we have not succeeded with that, but again, there might be an avenue where that could happen. F, public ac acquisition of White's Ferry in, in Maryland. Again, we don't necessarily see how this fits into the solution set now, but we would continue to be willing if public acquisition made a difference in getting the ferry restarted. And then lastly, G, explore new ferry operation uh, locations, and we are actively working on this now. Uh, Director Conklin, yeah. thank you for that very thorough uh, timeline of the work that you have been doing, that our State Department of Transportation uh, and partners across the river have been doing. Um, it is very obvious that uh, you've been doing extensive work and outreach and mitigation. Uh, to try and find a resolution and um, appreciate you detailing all of that this morning. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to um, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo, who can share with us um, the, the important work that he's been doing at the state level to try and find a solution here. Delegate. Thank you, and thank you, members of the Environment and Transportation Committee, for taking the time. Um, we really need to figure out how to jumpstart this because it has been going on three years now. Um, this started almost three years ago with a conversation between myself and, and Councilmember Friedson calling together meetings. Uh, we have had an ongoing, um, every couple of months, uh, my office with the other offices have been organizing meetings with the county council members, with the state, with state department of transportation, with the county department of transportation, with the Poolsville commissioners. Um, every few months, we get together via Zoom to try and figure out what our next options are. Um, and I think that um, um, Mr. Conklin did a very good job of explaining kind of the past and the present. So I, I think that the best thing to do here, and I think that also Councilmember Friedson put it pretty bluntly when he talked about the importance of White's Ferry and the fact that it is in private hands, um, mostly in another state, which ties our hands to a very large degree. Um, and the piece that I, that I would really like to focus on is the opportunity to speak directly to the parties that are involved. Um, and the reason I say that is because we have done so much on this side of the river and it's just lacking on the other side of the river. And I want everyone to know all the parties involved, Ms. Devlin and Mr. Kuhn specifically, to understand that while they are negotiating and while their negotiations fail, 
you're dealing with environmental issues, which we've already talked about. We're dealing with economic issues, which we've already talked about. But here's one of the issues that we're not talking about as much as we should. With seven to 800 cars per day going across that ferry, seven to 800 cars a day, that's hundreds of families who are having to leave early to go all the way up to Point of Rocks, either to come to Maryland or go to Virginia, sitting in traffic on Route 15. That's hundreds of families a day that have to leave early that aren't feeding their kids breakfast, that aren't having time with their families before they leave because they now have to leave 40 minutes or 30 minutes earlier. That is hundreds of families every day that are not getting to get home and have dinner with their family because they are sitting on Route 15 or sitting somewhere between Loudoun and Montgomery counties. Hundreds of families a day that aren't able to have dinner with their kids and hundreds of families a day that aren't able to tuck their kids in because by the time they get through all of the traffic that is Route 15 in Virginia, their kids are passed out asleep. So this is just not an issue of, of economics or environment. All of that it is. But we're talking about real families here, and I would just appeal, I'm begging these two parties to find a way to get past their issues. Find a way to compromise. We're begging you to find a way to make these issues go away. You've got to be able to find a way to compromise. I don't understand why this community in Poolsville and in Loudoun County are being held hostage by two private parties that just can't seem to find a way to compromise. Is it that hard to come to a compromise? Is it really that hard that you need to do all of this damage to all of these families, the environment and economics because you can't find a way to compromise? And with that said, I really wanna say thank you to to the County Council, to, to the Environment and Transportation Committee for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. And I will, I will close right now because I know there are other people that want to talk and I really want to hear from the two private parties what they're doing and what we can do, both from the state level and what the County Council can do to encourage that compromise. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think you summed it up better than any of us could have. Um, and the efforts that you and your colleague, Delegate Linda Foley, and the District 15 delegation um, and others have been doing is so incredibly important. Um, and thank you for taking time to be here today to help find a resolution. Thank you. Um, and so you, you spoke for the hundreds of residents and family members who have had to change their schedules and accommodate to this, this dynamic. And so uh, I'll now turn it over to the president of the Poolsville Commission, uh, Mr. Jim Brown. Um, thank you, uh, President Glass, appreciate it. The council too. I've actually got some thank yous for something that hasn't been accomplished yet, uh, but I'm gonna get to those in just a minute. And I actually, the purpose for us being here is really to ask the two parties to come together uh, that have not been able to forge an agreement and with the council's help, hopefully we can get there. Quickly, just some stats. You know, Poolsville, if you look at it, we're like a three-legged town, okay? and. If you can imagine, one of our legs has been cut off. Now that might be helpful for some people that just to have two legs, but those three legs are incredibly vital to how our town operates and our way of life in Poolsville. So think about it, you would never in Gaithersburg stop Route 355 from running where just there's a dispute and we have a public road that all of a sudden now is closed and no one can use it because maybe a contractor, which this feels like contractors, have decided that they can't get along. Um, that's what we have in Poolsville right now. That's missing. Um, I know this county cares about uh, clean energy and, and, and our environment, and I'm very proud of our record on that. I'm proud of our record in Poolsville as well, well as the county and the state. It's been estimated it's over 9 million extra miles. 9 million extra miles have been driven because of the ferry being closed. That's unfathomable. Who would come up with, uh, why is there some sort of access that's been blocked that creates 9 million extra miles of driving in a place that truly cares about how the environment works? 20% measurable drop off in revenue in our town's businesses. Okay, so this isn't just hearsay or asking a couple people. This is a measurable scenario. Pre-COVID, we are down 20% in our most of our business sector. 
our Puzzle Chamber of Commerce president is here. He's one of the people that have documented this. It's been an incredibly difficult scenario for our businesses because we rely on th through traffic. We're not a bedroom community, but we are still kind of a bedroom community. Our businesses require people to come through our town. Um, the ferry is a critical component of our way of life. Think about this. It's our history, right? We have so many important facets of being in the up county. We have Sugarloaf Mountain, thank goodness it's been reopened. We have uh, the canal, we have our parks, we have um, the rivers, Monoxie and uh, Potomac. All of those are critical components to a way of life that has been legislated by this council and by this state. We will be rural, we stay rural, we're rural for a reason. Farming is huge for us. Our, the components that make up our town and that make up the vitality of our town come from things like White's Ferry. Um, last but not least, it's a, uh, think about what happens when the ferry gets done. It's not just commuters, it's tourists. It's, uh, it's our residents that don't have a lot of services up where we live and there's uh, plenty of people that like it that way. It's quiet, but the ferry is an important part of our way of life. People like to take the ferry. We like being able to go over to Leesburg and Virginia. We like Virginia people coming through Poolsville and, and doing Poolsville things. It's, you can't look at it as just like it's a, it's a road that's not being used right now. It's a way of life. It's bigger than that. Um, and we hear from our residents every day. Um, Dave said it just right. There, is, there are people that do not get home to see their families. They must leave earlier. They must stay late. They have moved. I'm in real estate. I have helped many people, unfortunately, leave pools. Well, yes, they get replaced, but maybe they get replaced by people that don't have Virginia as part of their way of life. Commuting to Virginia is important for our area and for our region. Look at the map and look how close Poolsville is to Leesburg. So we, we rely on it. Um, I get to the thank yous, and I want to say to everybody, and this, this is a long line, but I'll make it quick, because I'm really more interested in hearing from the two people that can control this and create a, an answer. We have our council members. Uh, Andrew Friedson's been with us from the beginning. Marilyn's joined us on the fight. Or the rest of the council members have all expressed great interest. Of course, our delegation has been amazing. David's been a leader on all this. Um, the county executive has given it a go. He had a plan A and a plan B, and now we're on whatever plan this is. Uh, appreciate his efforts, though. Uh, fellow commissioners, our fair access team, Chamber of Commerce, our friends at the DOT, thank you, Chris. Emil, thank you guys for being so collaborative. Uh, Keith Miller, even at the Montgomery Revenue Authority. I ask you this, with all these people that have been involved, is today going to make a difference? Is the council going to make a difference? Can we drive a solution somehow today? We have the people in the room, you know, the virtual room. How do we make today difference that we can get this ferry going back across the river? It's not a bridge. It's not how much money was that parking garage going to cost, right? This is a boat going across the river. How do we do that? Thank you for your uh, time on this and the council, too. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you, giving. Uh, thank you, uh, President Brown, for giving voice to, to your residents. And you uh, mentioned a number of other issues that are all related to the quality of life in western, in the western part of the county in Poolsville, uh, and a lot of that has been advocated for uh, by the Fair Access Committee. Uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Hoeing if you have any brief comments so that we can get to our our virtual guests. Some of you know that uh, in my previous career, I worked in Congress for quite a few years as a staff director for a committee, so I do appreciate legislative bodies, and I appreciate you holding this hearing, Evan, and uh, all the council members being here today. It's very much appreciated. Uh, that said, we have had numerous events, and Andrew's been there, uh, Marilyn's been there, a lot of you have been there to these events, and none of them have really produced any action. Uh, they have produced more attention, and one of the things that did happen in most of these events was we did see press statements from both of the two parties involved, but generally they weren't providing solutions. They were just saying, here's what I've done, and it's really not my fault, it's the other guy's fault. So we need to change that dynamic this morning, I'm hoping, instead of having that kind of back and forth, saying, I have been proposing this, but I am willing to think about some other ideas. Here's some new ideas. I'd love to hear that happen. And if it doesn't happen, one thing I do want to make sure people know about is in our December 29th rally, and Evan, you were there, Andrew, Marilyn, um, you know that the Grinch made a presence that, that morning. And uh, I don't know who the Grinch was that day, but I will say this. 
if I have to put this mask back on again to make the point that we need to scare up a solution here, I will do so. <laughs> I thought a little light humor might help. I did want to add one other point though about the Ag Reserve. That is that this is also about the Ag Reserve and preserving it. It's about the history and culture of the area, but it's also about, you think about rustic roads. Rustic roads, we could just go ahead and say, let's improve all those roads and make them wider, make them safer in many ways, change the curves on them, that kind of thing. We don't do that. It's part of preserving the Ag Reserve. The ferry is a part of that same culture and history. So I think the county has a big stake in this uh, to help drive towards that process. Um, the other quite final thing I'd mention is that I'm no lawyer. I sometimes play one on TV, but I did have a lot of lawyers working under me when I was in Congress. And I generally would always ask them, okay, if it's not illegal, how do I get to that point? I know you don't want to do it. I know you say there's some problems here, but can we think outside the box for once on this and try to come up with something new? And I'll just give you one example, and I know that we've heard from DOT that they don't agree with this, but I think there's something to this. We know jurisdictions in Maryland that actually own facilities or rent facilities outside the jurisdiction because they need the public service that it involves. I think we can do that. I think we can think about doing that. So if we did take over the ferry, for example, in some way, uh, and then the, the county itself would make an offer in some way directly to try to get ownership or try to get uh, a, an agreement on the Virginia side, I think that is a possibility we should not discount without thinking about it. So thank you very much, and I, again, appreciate you taking the time on this. Uh, thank you. Um, and so joining us virtually, as I noted, um, are the two landowners uh, on both sides of the Potomac. Um, and because of time constraints, uh, Mr. Chuck Kuhn, who is the property owner on the Maryland side, uh, he has to leave soon, so I'm going to invite him to share some thoughts, and then we'll turn it over to Ms. Devlin, um, who we already see on the Zoom, and thank you for being patient during this entire presentation. Uh, but Mr. Kuhn, are you there? I sure am. Thank you, and, and thanks for pulling this together today. And that was an excellent recap of a event shared earlier with how we got to where we are today with the ferry. The only thing I'd like to, to remind everybody is my wife and I purchased the ferry back in February of 2021 after Herb Brown and his family had shut the ferry down and they were remo removing the ferry permanently from the river because they had exhausted all attempts to work together with Rockland Farm. Uh, we have been trying to work with Rockland Farm since uh, February of 21. Unfortunately, the majority owner of Rockland Farm is Peter Brown, who runs the Renaissance Technology Fund. Libby Devlin, who's with us here today, is a very minority uh, owner of the ferry, but the, the real majority owner and money behind Rockland's Peter Brown, and unfortunately, I cannot get him to participate in discussions or negotiations with respect to getting the ferry reopened. The, the other thing I would like to remind everyone, and, and Montgomery County, I know you've been very involved, um, 50 cents a car is problematic for Loudoun County, Montgomery County, the states of Virginia and Maryland. It would not work for Herb Brown, the previous owner, and it will not work for us. It's not just the offer of, of 50 cents a car, it's the terms and conditions Rockland Farm have put together along with the fee of 50 cents a car that would prevent us from being able to own and operate a marketable, profitable business that we truly could open up for the counties to rely on. Um, 50 cents a car may not sound like much. It's over 60% of the net profit of owning and operating the ferry. Uh, a few things that we have done since 2021, and and I want to caution Montgomery County a little bit. Those were pretty strong words shared this morning. Um, I'd like to remind Montgomery County that we have been trying to get you to purchase this ferry for over a year. And if Montgomery County was to purchase the ferry, they then could get VDOT, and VDOT has said they would participate. I've also spoken with the Loudoun Board of Supervisors. Uh, VDOT would uh, participate in using eminent domain to take an easement or a portion of the Virginia shoreline and we could get this ferry open. Uh, we've owned this ferry since, since February of 21. The only reason my wife and I bought the ferry was to protect the county, to keep the ferry in the river so we could get the ferry open again. Unfortunately, we've exhausted all attempts working together with Rockland. 
working together with Montgomery County, uh, Loudoun County, the states of Virginia and Maryland, we have offered to purchase Rockland Farm in its entirety. We've offered to purchase uh, or lease landing rights, either through an easement or through an outright purchase of a small aspect of Rockland Farm. We have offered to sell the ferry to Loudoun County at a discount to help get it open if they would use eminent domain to grab the shoreline and, and get the ferry moving again. As I mentioned earlier, we've offered to sell it to Montgomery County. Uh, we've offered to sell them the uh, Maryland shoreline that we own, not to mention the ferry and the ferry operation. Um, we've offered Rockland Farm, as you know, Montgomery County, a million dollars cash for landing rights in Virginia. Um, as I'm here on the, on the screen today, we will up that offer to 1.25 million to gain access to a very, very small piece of the Virginia shoreline, and we could get the ferry operating in 30 days. Since we've purchased the ferry, we've continued to maintain insurance on the ferry, pay taxes to Montgomery County for the shoreline and, and the ferry operation. Uh, we are carrying staff that's in place today, ready to get the ferry open again. We need more help from Montgomery County as I've been asking for almost two years, guys. But that, that's our position. We're happy to work together in any way we possibly can to get the ferry open. As recent as last week, I even called Rockland Farm, unable to get Peter Brown on the telephone. I was able to reach Libby, and, and in spite of commitments I made purchasing the ferry, um, I offered Rockland Farm the offer, uh, an opportunity to purchase the ferry and I will extend the same opportunity to them to utilize the Maryland shoreline, the 50 cents a car, if they would like to purchase the ferry and get it open. Our main goal, our main concern, is to get this ferry moving again and open for the communities. It doesn't matter to us if we make money. We're happy to sell it. We're happy to operate it. We just want to see it open again for the counties and communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. I know that you have some time constraints. I hope you can stay as long as you can so that we can engage in, in more conversation. Uh, but now I'd like to turn it over to, to Ms. Devlin, who's been patiently uh, listening to this entire conversation. And Ms. Devlin, I, I'll, I'll ask you a question to start this conversation. Um, throughout, throughout this hearing today, you've heard about the $9 million to $25 million loss in economic impact affecting the area, the 9 million additional vehicular miles that have polluted our region because of the closing of White's Ferry, and you've just heard Mr. Kuhn up his offer. Do we have a deal? Well, I've always said from the beginning that we want to have a per vehicle, per, char per car charge, so that we can, uh, you know, have a payment for the amount of encroachment on our property. Um, we are, we've, our farm has been, I'm the sixth generation, my children live on the farm, they are the seventh generation. We are not interested in selling our property. We have offered Loudoun County and Montgomery County permanent easement on our land for 50 cents a vehicle that has never been taken up. Um, we we have uh, offered 50 cents a car to Mr. Kuhn um, and his response as of Thursday was, uh, yeah, I'll do that if you purchase the ferry company from me for four and a half million dollars. Um, I, you know, we have, I, I've, we've tried to uh, work with another party for arbitration to get this thing resolved. Um, I have, uh, and Mr. Kuhn will do mediation, which is something that Rockland Farm tried with, uh, you know, years ago, years and years ago, and all it did was take up uh, two to three years of our time and got nowhere. So I, we are not interested in mediation. Arbitration, something that's binding, will work for us, and we are willing to take that risk. Uh, Mr. Kuhn has said no to that. Uh, we even had a mutual friend that my brother and Mr. Kuhn both know and trust, 
and he offered to arbitrate it. Mr. Kuhn said no. Um, we, uh, let's see, what else have we done? I have, <laughs> by just sheer uh, spending a lot of time and research and detailed research, found a nationally based company that is willing to run the ferry and work with both sides to compensate fairly. They even told me personally they would pay more than 50 cents per car. And um, that Mr. Kuhn has, was not interested in that either. Um, I have spent numerous, I can't tell you how much time I've spent. Um, <laughs> it's been like, a, you know, over the last three years, it's probably been a, a you know, at least a part-time job for me aside from running Rockland Farm. Um, and just gotten nowhere. So I don't, I feel that 50 cents a car is very reasonable. Most of the residents that I've spoken to over in uh, Poolsville and Montgomery County and Loudoun County as well are like, yeah, I'll pay 50 cents. What's the big deal? We started at a dollar. I feel like we've already come down. Um, and that I told Mr. Kuhn when we were talking to him that that was the lowest I would go. Um, so I, you know, and I, I don't know what Mr. Kuhn thinks my brother can solve by this. I mean, uh, he is, he's just a, a part owner. He is not a majority owner. Um, he is, all three of us are minority owners of Rockland Farm. And um, so, I, you know, we, unless he, unless one of us can get a vote from the other, each of us, you know, can, uh, none of us has the vote to control Rockland Farm. And we, we work as a family, but I am a resident there and my husband and I are running the place and making the decisions. So that is uh, where we're at. Of course, I consult with my brother and sister about it, but um you know i'm the one that is is the end i don't know decision maker sure uh so ms dublin thank you for sharing your your thought process with us you know throughout this morning's conversation uh, you have heard from uh, our county department of transportation in particular about a variety of options that have been pursued uh, and by your your own discussion and admission this morning you're holding firm to a, a 50 cent per car charge and so uh, i'm curious why you're not open to any of the other solutions that are being presented um, and also the other side of that is why 50 cents well uh as i said i don't know if you've seen the um letter that I sent summarizing, I sent it Friday, summarizing up to the most recent discussion that I had with Mr. Kuhn on Thursday, just all the efforts that we have made. Um, the 50 cents came about, the actual idea of the per vehicle charge came about from uh, our two supervisors, uh, our Catoctin District Supervisor and the uh, board uh, chair. Um, both said, just charge a you know dollar a car. So we started negotiating with a dollar a car originally, and um, it just the whole negotiations. Well, first of all, then in the middle of negotiation um, with Herb Brown, Chuck Kuhn bought, and we were actually in the process and made an offer to purchase. Uh, the ferry from uh, Herb Brown's family um, and uh, had were waiting for a response when I heard through the news that Mr. Kuhn had bought it. So um, we had been in negotiations to purchase it, um, but the 50 cents was when I was negotiating with Mr. Kuhn, it just, we were going around and around in circles and I just said, I can't do this discussion anymore. Here is my last and final offer, 50 cents of a car. And that's how it came back. How, and uh, one of my siblings said, listen, I'm afraid you're gonna go even lower. And I said, I promised I wouldn't. 
and uh, I've stuck to that. Okay, thank you for sharing us where the, the, the origin of that, that uh, figure comes from. And I'll share with you as an elected fi official here in Montgomery County, I regularly engage with our business community about uh, ways that we can improve things. And uh, sometimes it's workable and sometimes it's not. Uh, and so we all have to be flexible in our ideas and our suggestions. Uh, I'll turn it I over wish to you would ask Mr. Kuhn why he will not agree to binding arbitration. Uh, if he is still here, we can we can ask that question. Uh, and there, he just turns his camera on, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, yes, a few things. One, I think there's a, a couple of um, inaccuracies in what Libby shared there. One, uh, we did offer again Montgomery County to purchase the ferry, Loudoun County to purchase the ferry. We offered the Rockland Farm to purchase the ferry. She said we offered her to purchase the ferry for $4.5 million, and then I'd be willing to pay $0.50 cents a car. That doesn't make any sense. If Rockland Farm purchases the ferry, I do not need to pay $0.50 cents a car for anything. They would own and operate the ferry. No, I, I'm sorry. What you said on Thursday to me, and I, I, we, I confirmed that in a test, text message to you, if you recall, you, you said that was inaccurate. You said you would accept 50 cents a car only if we purchased the ferry business for 4.5 million. Yes, Libby, I think what you're confusing is my offer was if you all would like to purchase the ferry and you commit to getting the ferry open timely for the community, I would allow you all to use the Maryland shoreline at the same price you were allowing us to use the Virginia shoreline, 50 cents a car. I would not be paying that. I would not be paying that. You'd be paying that. Let me go back to the earlier comment too. Libby talked about being in mediation for two to three years without success. For clarification, that was with the previous ownership group. That was not and with. That was not with um, uh, me or, or my wife. Um, that's correct. Secondly. Um, Binding arbitration doesn't really make sense in this scenario. It's really mediation, I think, is what Libby is, is meaning to suggest. Um, not only did I agree to mediation, I utilized the mediator that they suggested. Uh, I met without naming names. I met with the, uh, the, the mediator. We discussed uh, different opportunities with respect to opening the ferry, even discussed Rockland Farm purchasing the ferry. I mean, I am, I am ready today to sell the farm to Rockland or sell the ferry to Rockland Farm if they commit to getting this ferry open timely. We'll sell it right now. Again, our goal was never to, to uh, own this ferry long term or to make money with this ferry. The only reason we bought this ferry was to try and keep it in the river and get it open for the communities. So if Montgomery County, Loudoun County, the states of Virginia or Maryland or Rockland Farm want to purchase this ferry, they could do so today, and we will allow use of the Maryland shoreline immediately to get the ferry open again. Ms. Devlin, you interested in purchasing the ferry? Um, well, first of all, um, well, how much? Um, I would like to know where Mr. Kuhn came up with the figure of 4.5 million. The other correction I think Mr. Kuhn is, misun is not clear on is that mediation is not binding. Arbitration is. And that's why we favor arbitration. And he is correct uh, um, that the mediation that took two to three years was uh, through um, the prior owner. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't want you to misunderstand that. Okay. But guys, in, in, uh, you know, Montgomery County, has a letter of intent from us in your possession right now. And we could go to contract in, in five days if you all would like to purchase the ferry and get VDOT to use eminent domain to open this ferry back up. If anyone from Loudoun County is watching, you also have a letter of intent in your possession. Loudoun County can purchase this ferry and they could use eminent domain to get the ferry open. The reason this ferry is not opening today, in my opinion, is the counties are not working together to purchase this ferry and use eminent domain to getting it open. The Brown family, prior to my ownership, was unable to work out terms and conditions in Rockland Farm to the point that they were shutting down a business 
Their family ran for hundreds of years because they've exhausted all measures to work with Rockland. You're hearing me today after two and a half, almost three years, my wife and I have exhausted all efforts of getting this ferry open, working together with Rockland Farm. Peter Brown is the largest shareholder in Rockland Farm. If he could come to the table, maybe it would be different. But my success in working together with Libby Devlin is the same success or failure that Montgomery County and Loudoun County and the Brown family have had trying to get this ferry open. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the district council member, I, council member. I just Ballard. want to point out one more thing. Because I have found this other company, ferry company, to run the ferry, I do not, if I could, if we could purchase, and we have offered this, Mr. Kuhn's Landing at a profit to him, we've made that offer several times, we do not need to purchase the ferry company with those ferry assets. Um, I have the company ready to go. They will come in and run the ferry for us, and they will bring in another boat. And, um, we, we do not need the ferry assets. In fact, mm -hmm. Herb Brown told me when we were talking that basically the boat is, is pretty much nothing more than scrap metal at this point. It's so old. Libby, Herb Brown told you that because the boat was not being operated, therefore it was not useful. You're bringing solutions where we do not have problems. We have a ferry boat. As I mentioned earlier in this call, we have been paying staff to stand by ready to operate this ferry. We have the ferry. We have the ferry barge. We have the ferry staff. We have the Maryland shoreline. Bringing in an operator is not a solution. We have an operator. Bringing in a ferry is not a, not a solution. We have a ferry. You agreeing to a reasonable fee and easement or allowing us to use the location so we can open the ferry is what's necessary. I'll give you $1.25 million in cash today. Stop holding up this ferry from operating. You are hurting the community. You're not hurting me. I don't use the ferry. You're hurting these communities. I'm going to turn it over to the council member who represents that area, council member Balcom. Uh, thank you. I just have a couple questions about the 50 cent fee. Uh, and so I'm going to ask um, everyone, uh, so have, have we had a discussion about increasing the per, the per car price cost per car to supplement that fee? Has that been part of the discussion? It, it has, thank you. And I'd like to go back to my earlier comment. Um, the 50 cents a car is problematic for a few reasons. In the future, Montgomery County and Loudoun County could not take over the operation of this ferry at a 50 cents per car. They don't have a way to budget or plan for it, from what I'm being told from the counties and the states. And a greater problem than that is, and I've shared this with Montgomery County and Loudoun County, you would have to read the terms and conditions that Rockland Farm wants to accommodate the 50 cents a car. They want to write to shut the ferry down at any time for any reason. They That's want to not true. That, that is not true. Montgomery County, you have a copy of the document. So can uh, we just can so we just it. talk about the so currently what is the before the ferry closed, what was the cost for uh a ferry for for the fair for the cars to ride the ferry five dollars one way and eight dollars round trip so have has there been a discussion about adding a 50 cent surcharge for the landing there, there has been a discussion and, and one of the problems from an economic standpoint is uh, the ferry has not operated in three years all expenses have gone up right land taxes have gone up salaries have gone up the Coast Guard regulations and what's required to run that ferry as far as staffing have gone up, you're going to increase the cost of the ferry to the point that it will no longer be a viable option for the community. It's going to be worse than trying to utilize the toll road. So we, we can't keep stacking on fees to the, to the ferry on top of the fees that are already going to have to happen when the ferry opens up, not to mention Montgomery County and Loudoun County do not have a way to work with the, the per car per day option. 
So it will not work long term for us as an operator. It won't work for the counties in the future. Okay. And then the uh, there is another question about uh, Ms. Devlin. You mentioned that you were willing to that you were working with uh, Mr. Brown to purchase the ferry prior to uh, Mr. Kuhn's. Did you come up with a purchase price at that point as to how much you would you would be willing to pay for the ferry? Yes, and that's why I wanted Mr. Kuhn to answer where he came up with his four point five million dollar offer. And what was that? What were you willing to pay? We were willing to purchase the ferry plus all the real estate that came with it, and there was uh, more than just the ferry landing with that. Um, and for four point five million, we made that offer back in February of twenty twenty one or January of twenty twenty one. So, would you be and willing may, to purchase that? Would you be willing to purchase the ferry for four point five million dollars today? I am not sure at this point. I mean, the ferry's been closed for almost three years. People have worked out ways to go around. I don't know, and I'd need to, uh, for one thing, Mr. Herb Brown would not let me look at the books and records um, except in person for about a half an hour. I was not allowed to do a complete analysis of the most recent books. So that was one of the questions I asked him when he wanted me to up the fee from 4.5 million. I said, I need to look at the books and records in person and have a uh, you know accountant uh, examine them in detail, and he never responded. And the next thing I knew, Mr. Kuhn okay. had purchased it. Thank so I would need. To, I can't. I don't know that my family would take that risk of 4.5 million at this day and time. Okay. Thank since you. Since the ferry's been cold for so, thank you. For and so then, long. Thank you. And Mr. Kuhn's, when you when you talk about selling the ferry, are you talking about selling the uh, the the landing? Uh, the the land for the landing strip. Um, yeah. So when we, if you look at the letter of intent that we gave Loudoun County quite some time ago, uh, we gave them a couple of different options. One of the options would be to purchase the ferry, the ferry operation, and the Maryland landing. Okay. Thank you. When, and with talking to Libby Devlin, we offered to sell her the ferry, the ferry operation, and then give her. Um, a, a licensing agreement or an easement to utilize the Maryland landing. Okay. And then this question and is... Loudoun County has the same. Thank you. And this question is for Mr. Conklin. Uh, the statement that um, if Montgomery County owned the ferry, uh, VDOT has agreed to um, use eminent domain. Can you, can you talk about that? I can. Um, we had several meetings with VDOT. Um, I'm trying to remember the time frame. I need my timeline to remember it, but I think it was last summer. Um, and they were not willing to establish a Virginia capital project, which would give them the authority to use eminent domain. Um, and they said that was irrespective of whether it was publicly or privately owned. Now, those statements aren't forever and always. The Virginia Department of Transportation can always change their mind about what they're willing to do, but in our conversation, they were not willing to use their eminent domain authority regardless of the ferry ownership uh, and believed that that matter was best handled by Loudoun County. And of course, Loudoun County has had the opportunity to use their authority and has declined to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Uh, next, Vice President Friedson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm very frustrated. I know everybody here is very frustrated because you know, I've been at this for almost three years, like many people here have been, uh, and we're essentially in the same place we have been. It's a he said, she said, they said. Uh, it's a we can't do this or we won't do this because they won't do that, and not a here's what I am willing to do to make this happen. And I just want to share how frustrating that is to me, and I know to, to many of us. I understand that everybody has their interests here. I understand that uh, everybody is advocating for their interests. Uh, but the people who have been holding the bag are the residents of Montgomery County and of Loudoun County and of the broader region. And there is nothing that has been shared here that demonstrates any change of opinion, any change of heart, any real interest 
in moving this uh, this forward. So I, I have a few questions, and I would ask uh, for our guests, who I appreciate you joining here uh, today, to direct your answers to me and not to each other, if you would. I think it'll be more uh, helpful in that way. But um, Ms. Devlin, you noted that uh, Loudoun County uh, suggested the $1 per car, which you've since reduced to 50 cents per car. Has Loudoun County ever offered uh, to you or suggested to you that they'd be willing to participate in some of the cost of the dollar or the 50 cents a car, as Montgomery County has indicated its willingness and interest to participate? Um, we, <clears throat> um, we sent Loudoun County an offer and Montgomery County for a permanent easement on our landing in exchange for 50 cents a car. Um, Montgomery County received almost the identical offer. Our attorney wrote up a document that justified how this can legally happen. Um, we were, a, we, it, you know, the per day per car fee was uh, worked out as a, you know, I, and I also had told Montgomery County when I talked to Chris Con Conklin that we would be happy to delay getting paid till they had to work within their budget. Yeah, so I just, just, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah, in the interest of time, has Loudoun County, Loudoun County suggested to you to make a particular offer yes. of a certain dollar amount. Did they dollar, suggest that they would, do, did they suggest that they would be willing to pay all or any of that cost? Montgomery, we've heard today no. from the Department of Transportation, and I have been part of these conversations for a long time, that Montgomery County has been willing to participate in that cost. I'm asking, this was suggested to you by Loudoun County. We've had a challenge of getting Loudoun County to come in good faith to participate in a solution that would serve both Loudoun County and Montgomery County residents. And I'm just asking if not only suggesting that you ask for money from another entity, but whether or not they were willing to participate in any way to solve the problem. Just well, yes or we, no. We sent that offer um, and they have not responded. Okay. No, it's n n by the basis of silence. I'll take that. You took that as a no, I assume, uh, as, uh, as as I do, Mr. Conklin. Do you have a follow-up? I did just want to clarify that Loudoun County was one of the partners in the joint for the two hundred thousand dollars, but for, not for the per per, not car, for the per car payment, car which payment. is what Miss Devlin has said is Correct. the only scenario that she would uh, entertain, um, uh, 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 except for outright purchase, uh, as you mentioned. I just want to make sure I got that right. Okay. Um, Mr. Kuhn, um, thank you for mentioning timely for the community. Uh, I will note uh, that all of us are here because this hasn't been timely for the community. We're here for over two and a half years trying to get this uh, boat back in the water to serve uh, hundreds and hundreds of cars a day uh, and serve thousands of families. Uh, in November of 2021, you uh, noted the offer that you made for $13.5 million for the entirety of the farm, which was rejected as we heard today. You also noted that you had proposed to donate the ferry and the land to the governments, you know, if this would be public, if it would help to reopen the ferry. Does that offer still remain today that you would be willing to donate the ferry and the land if it would facilitate a deal? So a couple of pieces. One, I want to make a clarification. Loudoun County, Montgomery County, and the Kuhn family made a joint effort to Libby Devlin that was turned down for the, for the Virginia shoreline. Loudoun County standalone, I've read it, it's public document, met an offer, made an offer to Rockland Farm to acquire the landing zone and other ground that was turned down. So guys, please let's make sure we're dealing with the truth and and you can use the Freedom of Information Act to get the documents and the county appraisals, the county's offers. Offers have been made to Rockland Farm by Loudoun County and jointly between Kuhn, Montgomery, and Loudoun. Back to your, back to your question, Andrew. I am willing to make a sizable donation <laughs> to Montgomery County if they can commit to getting this ferry open timely. We've, we've uh, carried a lot of expense since I offered to give this to the, to the county for free, uh, carrying the staff, carrying the ferry, carrying the taxes. With that said, I'm absolutely willing to make a sizable donation to Montgomery County and Loudoun County if they can commit to getting this ferry open timely. 
Miss Devlin, if 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 the land and the ferry are donated to the county, so that this is a public entity, and you're not negotiating with Mr. Kuhn, does that change in any way your request for either to the four and a half million that you would need, or the the other suggestions that you made on the per car costs? So, are, what are you asking if 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 Mr. Kuhn donated the landing and the ferry to either county. I, I guess it would have to be Montgomery County. Um, I'm sorry, what did you- Yeah, does that change in any way your, your willingness to come to an agreement here? I mean, my goal here is to get the ferry open immediately, number one, and number two, to avoid this horrible scenario from ever happening again. And the only way to do that, frankly, is to get both of you and any other private entity out of this deal moving forward so that it's in public hands. Mm -hmm. Long term, to me, that is the only option in perpetuity to avoid a scenario where we wake up one morning and a critical transportation infrastructure that hundreds and hundreds of families have been relying on is not taken out of service abruptly and not returned to service with no end in sight. And so I, I, you know, if we could solve both of those problems Immediately, that would be an ideal scenario. The question is of whether or not uh, we'd be you know, able to make that happen. What you heard from Director Conklin is that we can't make a purchase if we don't have any indication that it would actually solve the problem. And that, that's, that's the issue that we have. Yes, Loudoun County and Montgomery County and Mr. Kuhn made an offer. That offer has been rejected. It was not structured apparently in a way that you would accept. But we they, can't purchase. We can't purchase the, the the property or have it donated to us, and assume the costs of operating. You know, paying the staff and doing the other things that uh, Mr. Kuhn is uh, you know is apparently doing right now. If we have no indication that it's going to lead to the resolution to the problem, and so what we need to get at here is what needs to happen for us to get a resolution to the problem. So I'm asking you. What would you, if Montgomery County and Loudoun County together, or Montgomery County specifically, was in control, complete control, Mr. Kuhn was entirely out of this deal, what would need to happen to get the boat in the water within the next 30 days? Well, we, I, have you seen the, um, the offer for the permanent easement that we sent to Montgomery County? Yes. I don't see why that's not viable. And and I think it is a myth of uh, Mr. Kuhn keeps saying whatever we've offered, we have the ability to shut down the ferry at a whim. That is not true. I mean, it was a pretty binding. Our attorney, you know, made it very viable for you all to make this happen. And we paid for that. You know, So I don't see what... There's no hold up there. If if the public is willing to pay the extra fifty cents, there's no hold up. Okay. Last question, then I'll turn it back to colleagues. Is there a lump sum amount that you would be willing to entertain that would equal a certain amount of the amortized fifty cents for a certain period of time that you could get in a lump sum or over a you know a payment plan that would not be a 50 cent per car dynamic because one of the concerns that I have had and I have heard from the stakeholders here is that there's not an interest in being a partner. And I can understand that based on what we've heard today that you two don't seem like pretty viable partners at this point. And the prior owner didn't seem like a viable uh, partner with, with you and there was a concern about the counting of the cars and whether or not that would lead to more lawsuits and more disruptions and more delays. And so the question is, is there a lump sum amount that would take that concern out that you would be willing to accept? And how would you calculate that? As I mentioned earlier, we, the farm has been in our family since 1817. Um, we are not interested in selling our property. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, I'm, we, just, just to clarify, I'm not asking for the cost for the 13 half million or any other amount for your farm. I'm not asking you to give up your family's legacy in that sense. I'm asking whether there's a lump sum for the easement 
to allow for the ferry to be operational, that would be equivalent to a certain number of years or you know a certain period of time that could you know what would well, that sure what would that look like from your perspective or is that not something that you'd be willing to entertain? Well, we're really not interested in that because I don't know uh, what kind of traffic you're all going to have going over there. If we, you know, how much is going to be encroaching yeah. on our land? So um, yeah, I'm not going to ask you any more questions. I'll just note that if you take a lump sum, it takes that risk out that you seem to be concerned about of the traffic not returning. That would take it entirely out, and you could take your money and go make more money off of it, and your family could benefit from their significant amount of legacy in that land by making money to you know to support it but I, I will yield back I hope that you will think about that and entertain that because I do think that that's a viable path forward but I'll, I'll yield back to you mr. president thank you councilmember Stewart great thank you um, first I want to thank all my colleagues for their diligent and persistent work on this and uh, president Brown for your work in Poolsville um, and um, the the D15 team. Um, Director Conklin, um, I have some questions for you, and thank you for that excellent presentation. As someone who's a bit newer to this conversation, um, your timeline was incredibly helpful. Um, we keep talking about the 50 cent per car and what um, some officials in Loudoun County threw out as a dollar. From where I sit, how this has been discussed, it sounds fairly arbitrary. Um, do we have from the studies that have been done before any, and I think this was asked before, where that number came came from and whether or not there should be some type of um, cost analysis done now. Is, is that actually appropriate? I don't, I don't think that number has any analytic basis. Okay. Um, the, the land area that would be subject to this easement is very small. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's not usable for any other purpose, so it's hard to correlate um, what what a rent payment would be, which is essentially what this is. Um, so no, I don't think there's any basis for it other than it's a nice round, relatively small per unit number. Great. And um, in the past, have we engaged with uh, whoever the supervisor or chair at Loudoun County to inquire about the numbers that were suggested? Yeah, we've had extensive conversation with Loudoun County staff and also the elected officials in Loudoun County. Yeah. And and anything specific on this number that it sounds like they threw out at one point or? I think that was a suggestion for Ms. Devlin to offer to Mr. Kuhn. Not that I don't think they had an expectation of participating in a mm -hmm. ongoing payment and they've expressed to us as much that much like when Montgomery County does a project, we don't typically enter into a long term rental agreement for a transportation project, nor do they, and they have other capital projects that affect Rockland Farm and will be doing fee simple acquisition for those. And that's typically the route they take and that's what they've expressed their willingness to do. And to be fair, they've been very cooperative and engaged in trying to structure a solution along mm -hmm. those lines, but it hasn't been successful. Yes. No, absolutely. And I didn't mean that to be, I work very well <laughs> with my colleagues in Loudoun County and I, uh, I'm sure they, they also want a solution. Um, I know, you know, in Virginia, they're facing elections right now. So they're, uh, they're, they may be a bit more distracted on other things. Um, but I do want to go back to the point that was mentioned by a number of people. And I think the conversation today illustrates, um, the dangers of having private entities own a public, what is basically a public good and, and facility. And so, um, and I really appreciate the solutions and outlining them as you went through them. I, I don't think I saw, but rem see I've, if I missed it, whether or not it has been explored or if it's just not a great idea to think of some type of regional transportation ferry system agreement. Now I know this is, we're talking about one ferry here. Um, but we do have regional transportation um, agreements. Um, you know, they're not always working smooth, as smoothly as we want, but is that an option here of just completely taking it, this out of private hands and setting up some type of regional ferry system? Yes, and that had been a focus during the study phase in the mm -hmm. first year of this uh, debate. 
about how a ferry could be operated in a public context, and there had been discussion of a joint agency formed by Montgomery and Loudoun County to be that operator. That may or may not be the most effective way to do it. The real issue is the land rights to land the boat at the moment, not yeah. not the operational strategy. I'm fairly confident the two counties are one of the two counties, or neither of the two counties it could be. As Ms. Devlin has suggested, a private operator under contract to one of the governments, or if Mr. Kuhn were to operate the ferry, it could be in that model too if it were in public ownership. Um, so that is a possibility. It may or may not be necessary. Okay. Um, thank you. I just want to again thank my colleagues, Director Conklin, and everyone who's been uh, involved with this. Thank you. I appreciate my colleague and the chair of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments for always looking for regional <laughs> solution, uh, particularly to our transportation problems. So thank you, uh, Council Councilmember Stewart. Uh, so this has been uh, a nuanced conversation, um, and. Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Devlin, I'm, I'm going to afford you uh, very brief closing comments based, and based on what you've heard today, not only from the elected leadership here in Montgomery County, but after listening to each other, is there anything that you can say that gets us further to the goal of opening up White's Ferry today? Uh, and, and Mr. Kuhn, we'll start with you. If it's okay, uh, ladies first. Let me go right ahead. Okay. Um, well, I would just say that um, we have tried to be as flexible as possible um, over these past few years. Um, I could talk to my family. Uh, if, if Mr. Kuhn would show us all the books, um, uh, in detail and let us examine the books on the ferry. Um, I could look at that and see if we can come up with an offer uh, to purchase the whole thing. Um, I understand that you may still want the 50 cents in addition for your landing. Um, we could offer to purchase your landing as well. Um, we Feel, I feel that the 50 cents per vehicle is very reasonable, and I do believe there are ways for our attorneys to structure such a deal so that you kind of have your fa uh, fears alleviated that the ferry will not be shut down at a whim. Um, I will certainly speak to my family about whether there is a lump sum payment that will make it worth uh, us giving up our historic land, but uh, right now I'm, that is not something we are interested in. We we want to keep the our historic property intact as it is. Um, and I again, we are still open to um, arbitrating the matter. Um, and I definitely have had sympathy for. I mean, uh, first of all. The traffic on Route 15 directly affects me as a resident of Rockland Farm because it goes right in front of my house and the expanded highway is going to affect our historic property. So I definitely want to see the ferry open. I have sympathized with the Montgomery County and Loudoun County uh, ferry goers and beyond that. Um, but all we have been looking for is a fair compensation, which we have never really received, for the use and encroachment on our property. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Um, you know, th thank you guys again. And, and I think the question is, is there anything we can reconsider? And there are a few things that we can reconsider. Uh, one, quickly, Libby, there are no books. We purchased this, this ferry in February of 2021 after your family had it shut down in the court of law. Um, so we don't have any books to show you. The, the ferry, we've been told by appraisers, you said it in your own words today, you were offering $4.5 million to purchase it prior. Uh, we've been told by appraisers 4.5 is is the right number. Um, if you want to buy the ferry, buy the ferry and we'll give you immediate use of the Maryland shoreline without hesitation. And we could have this ferry, you can use the staff, you can use the ferry, you can use the Maryland shoreline 
and we even have the cable that's necessary sitting on the ground ready to go. This ferry could be moving within 30 days. If you want to buy the ferry, buy the ferry. But leave, follow, or get out of the way. The only reason this ferry is not moving is because Rockland Farm will not get out of the way. 50 cents. Montgomery County, thank you guys. Um, if you really want the ferry to move, we'll sell you the ferry. If Loudon wants the ferry to move, we'll sell you the ferry. We'll sell it at a tremendous discount. We'll make a substantial donation if you guys commit to making action and getting this ferry to operate. To, to, the, to the community members of Montgomery County, Poolsville, uh, Loudoun County, and the surrounding areas, I'm sorry. When my wife and I bought this ferry in February of 21, we thought we could get it open and get it serving the community. We are not getting the cooperation we need to make it happen. Um, Peter Brown, billionaire Renaissance Fund Manager Peter Brown, what I offer you here today is this. I will donate this ferry in its entirety to the county. We will donate the Maryland shoreline. If you will donate the Virginia shoreline, we will walk away without a dime if you stop obstructing the operation of this ferry. So Montgomery County, thank you. We will do anything we can do to help get this ferry going. Sell it to you, sell it to Devlin, sell it to the county, or I'll donate it if Peter Brown will step up and donate the Virginia shoreline. I don't mean their family farm. I mean the small patch of shoreline that this ferry has operated on for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's all. Uh, thank you both for, for participating in this conversation. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to have this committee hearing is so that we could publicly share everybody's perspectives not only the two property owners and the, the ferry operators, but the actual impact that this closure is making in our community for the hundreds of families and hundreds of residents, the millions of dollars in economic loss, the millions of carbon emissions that continue being spewed. Oh. And Ms. Devlin said it correctly when she said, I want to see this ferry open. And I know that every single one of us here agree with you. So let this public conversation uh, move forward. Uh, there have been frustrating aspects of it, uh, but I hope that we all hold out a little more hope that the two property owners and all of the governments involved uh, can work together, not for their own personal gain, but for the benefit of all of our residents. And so thank you all for participating in this important conversation. Thank you. But guys, we can't hold out for hope. One, in 2023, we should be talking about a bridge, not a ferry. Hope is not going to get it there. Montgomery County, we need action. Th thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank, thank you all. We have one more item on today's agenda that we have to get to. So again, thank you for everybody for taking time out of your morning or almost afternoon to join us today. Thank, thank you so for allowing us to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the third and last item on our agenda this morning is an executive regulation regarding residential permit parking. This is executive regulation 1823, which governs Montgomery County Department of Transportation's residential permit parking program and updates to this program regarding consideration of new residential parking permits on block faces that are not exclusively for residential use. Uh, as we know that there are more and more neighborhoods that are uh, dealing with on-street parking, some lacking it and trying to figure out how their communities can accommodate the needs. And so with that, um, I will turn it over. Who we turn it over to? There we go. First presentation, sir. Indeed. Um, we're, uh, we're getting kicked off here with a fun one. Um, this is uh, an amendment to the uh, regulations surrounding the residential permit parking program. Um, I'll quickly turn it over to DOT staff to walk you through some of the justification for these for these amendments. 
Um, I will highlight uh, that these amendments almost in their entirety come from one particular case, from one particular residential permit parking area. Um, Quebec Terrace in Silver Spring. Um, this is a, a permit parking area that has been created already under the current structure of the program, uh, and residents in that area have found it not to be adequate. Um, my recommendations, um, and, and would it be helpful for me to walk through the program, or are we all sort of familiar with the, the structure? Uh, yeah. uh, well, so Mr. Kenny, welcome. Uh, Thank you. First off, for those uh, who are following the conversation, uh, Mr. Kenny is the t and &E Committee's uh, new analyst. Uh, as, we, um, as we staff up and deal with other transitions that are occurring. So Mr. Kenny, yeah, so if you want to go through the packet and then we can turn it over to, to uh, MCDOT for, for additional thoughts. Great. So uh, very basically, the residential uh, permit parking program uh, was designed to alleviate parking congestion um, in residential communities adjacent to uh, commercial or business areas that drive a lot of traffic. Um, so if, you're, if you live in a home um, that's near you know, a, a heavily trafficked commercial corridor um, and you have people that are regularly parking on your street and taking up your, uh, your, your street parking, you can apply for a, uh, the creation of a residential permit parking area in your, on your block and on adjacent blocks that are affected. You submit that application to DOT, they review it, they conduct an analysis, they hold public hearings. If they approve, they will draw up a residential permit parking area, an RPPA, um, that will uh, require permits uh, in order to be able to park there. Residents can apply for as many permits as they have vehicles registered to their address um, and any other vehicles that park on that block uh, that are not registered or permitted under the program are subject to enforcement. Um, this particular issue, and uh, you, you, you know, I can walk through the proposed changes, um, three of which are textual and address general concerns. Um, the fourth adds language that applies to only the Quebec Terrace RPPA located on Quebec Terrace in Silver Spring. Um, this comes after, and, and folks from DL, DOT that are here with us, um, Michael Paler in particular, who runs this program, will walk through why those changes were made and, and I'm sure what you know, community feedback spurred those changes. Um, but the crux of the change is that uh, this would require on that particular area um, that permits uh, can only be issued one per household, one per residence, as opposed to multiple per residence to accommodate any vehicles that are registered to that address. Sure. That is, uh, you know, th these, these changes are being made there due to the uh, density of the area, um, given that, you know, if the residents in the area have found that if uh, folks living there are able to purchase, or, or rather receive, or purchase, yeah, I believe there's a fee with it, um, permits uh, for as many vehicles as are registered to their household, that that still creates, you know, tr burdensome uh, traffic or parking congestion uh, concerns um, that could be addressed by limiting it just to one permit per household. Uh, my recommendations on this matter are pretty simple. It's that this is a real concern um, in high density areas. Um, it makes sense that perhaps only one permit per household be evaluated, be, be issued. My, my recommendation is that uh, the committee uh, turn this issue back over to Montgomery, uh, the MCDOT, um, for further consideration of perhaps other parking areas uh, to which this might apply, so that you know in the future when the purple line comes in or, or some other impact areas are assessed, um, that there be a rule in place to, to be able to handle these other RPPAs, um, and you know DOT doesn't need to go through another regulatory process to address them um, so that we we look ahead instead of just addressing uh, this one issue um, but I'm sure uh, DOT folks have uh, some thoughts uh, that they would like to share as well and I think this will be a good conversation so very I, good uh, thank you Mr. Kenny uh, Director Conklin Mr. Par Paler uh, I'll let Mr. Paler speak to the substance of this there are, there is a nuance in the uh, text revisions that addresses a different RPP area where we have some needs that became obvious there, but I'll let Mr. Paler speak to that. Good morning, Chair Glass and Honorable um, uh, Councilmember Balcom and, and Stewart. Um, 
taking a quick step back, the RPP program and, and the edits associated with this particular executive regulation seek to tackle two issues. One issue is the um, was the language in the previous um, executive regulation that outlined the inability of RPP areas to be established near uh, adjacent to properties that were uh, not used for residential, uh, that weren't residentially used, but were zoned for residential use. And um, we noticed, especially with Chevy Chase Lake Drive in, in, in Chevy Chase and Bethesda, we noticed that there was a dearth of parking, but we couldn't assign a particular area as an RPP because there was undeveloped property. And um, in the spirit of being fair, we would say that property had the potential of being developed, but in this case it did not. It was undevelopable, but the regulation stood. So we sought to clarify the regulation to allow uh, some of these areas to be designated for RPP locations so that we could address the Dartha parking in neighborhoods and communities. And then consequently, Quebec Terrace came up, which Mr. Kenny brought up, and Quebec Terrace being a and a one-off from uh, the experiences that we've had when we've looked at uh, establishing RPP areas, we looked at how we might be able to solve some of their internal issues, particularly those surrounding safety. So this particular area, uh, Quebec Terrace, uh, did not qualify for the, for the RPP program because, as Mr. Kenny outlined, the RPP program targets communities that are experiencing parking from external entities and taking parking from community members. The parking issue at Quebec Terrace was, was solely internal. Well, I shouldn't say solely, but when we did our evaluation, we determined that about 70% of the parking in Quebec Terrace was, was germane to Quebec Terrace. Now, that 30%, there are questions because we have noted that even though the uh, license plates and the reg registrations for those 30% those vehicles show out-of-state residency, we, st we have come to understand that many of those vehicles are residing in Quebec Terrace, so we don't really know what, the, what that number is. So the bottom line is the, the uh, previous structure of the RPP did not address Quebec Terrace's unique needs, that they have internal parking issues. And so we sought to, to find a solution for them because their internal parking DARTH was leading to um, assaults and vandalism and some other crimes. And so that's a one-off from the particular program. I don't know exactly, and of course the other main thing, because those those three things, uh, the assignment of adjacent property, Quebec Terrace, and then also looking at opportunities to, to eliminate, if possible, the public hearing fee for communities that uh, simply did not have the uh, fiscal resources to accommodate that. So those are really the big three elements, and I certainly welcome your questions uh, or comments on this and how we might be able to, to, to address some of your concerns that you uh, th thank you for highlighting that, and uh, I'll, I'll share with you that my team and I, over the last number of years, have spent a lot of time in Quebec Terrace, um, predating uh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Stewart's arrival to the council, uh, and I know she has uh, assisted in those efforts as well. And the residents in that neighborhood um, were scared about parking, that people uh, were accosting neighbors. Um, that there were fights um, and just a general fear about where they're going to park and who might uh, fight with them if they took the wrong spot. And so uh, this is needed. Um, and there are other challenges with that, with that general area, so I'm glad you recognize the unique nature of that particular community. Um, you know, and only compounding that is something else that I'd been working on, recognizing that their their bus line had been detoured for, for a period of time. So you have this compounded problem where residents don't have the bus that they normally access uh, and they don't have parking because of uh, internal confusion and concern. So uh, the the TLC that's that's been needed is being granted here. Um, I, I appreciate that. I support these changes. Um, I'll turn it over to the district council member now. Great. Thank you so much for that and um, for your work on this. I know particularly on Quebec Terrace, there were uh, there was a lot of engagement 
with the community and looking at a solution for a very difficult issue. And I just really appreciate, um, again, our regional services and our Department of Transportation for um, taking that time and really listening to the community uh, to find a solution or to work towards. I won't say, <laughs> I won't get ahead of ourselves um, and say it is the solution, but it is working towards a solution in this area. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I first wanted to go back to something Mr. Kenny said when he teed us up for this um, in thinking um, long term about the residential parking permits um, and thinking about how we deal with areas where we do have multifamily um, residences because it seems to me that the RPP is kind of set up more in areas where we had single family homes and no Mr. Paler's like saying he doesn't think so but um, and it but I, I appreciate the uh, the change on on waiving the fee and uh, and again the engagement in Quebec Terrace um, but I think one of the concerns we have as we're and I mentioned this earlier when we were talking is about the purple line stops and where where those parking issues one now that we're under construction and we're unfortunately going to continue to be under construction for a little bit um, and then also once that is once that's done looking at those areas where we have the purple line stops and the potential for people to be driving to those purple line stops because you know we're still in a in a progress right in, in connecting all of our public transit so I think those are long-term conversations but I, I want to kind of get them out there and have us um, address those before I mean they are upon us but really be thinking about how um, we can address those in the long term because there are a number of places um, I think along the neighborhoods along the communities along the purple line who are feeling right now the pinch of construction as well as you know in the future are going to have people park in their neighborhoods um, along purple line stops uh, and what that's going to mean um, you know I don't director Conklin if you want to address I that can now. speak to that to yeah briefly the purple line stops were added to the eligibility for the RPP program a couple years ago and they're exempt from a number of the qualifying criteria that apply outside the metro metro station zones so in the long term the RPP program should be able to manage the influx of vehicles that are trying to access the purple line to the extent that happens. Um, it does not address the construction related issues that we've had now or some areas where development has occurred anticipating the purple line mm -hmm. available to meet transportation needs and it isn't, which is the Chevy Chase Lake Drive yeah. example. Um, so that's kind of the, the rationale for those changes. The Quebec Terrace treatment is entirely different in that neighborhood is I won't say it's unique because I'm sure there might be something else like it, but uh, there is not a reservoir of off-street parking associated with these multifamily units, and the streets were designed with head-in parking like you would yeah. typically see in an a apartment complex, uh, which is not the norm in Montgomery County. And usually the rationing of parking to residential units in a multifamily development happens by the management <laughs> of that development. In this case, there's multiple owners and there's no overall management uh, to deal with the parking resource and the residential unit. So that's why this is kind of a one-off. And I, I think we would prefer to treat it that way that rather than, as Mr. Kenny suggests, providing more flexibility that get us into rationing parking for multifamily development generally. Yeah. Which we don't yet know how or if this approach will work for Quebec Terrace, and I think we would be premature in expanding the opportunity for this to other situations. And, the RPP program traditionally, yes, it has some single family focus, but its design is to reduce <laughs> external pressure on parking serving residential mm -hmm. needs, whether that's multifamily or single family. It just so happens that most of the applications of it are single family neighborhoods near the business districts. Mm -hmm. Great, that's super helpful. Thank you for that update and how the RPP program will be working once we have the purple line up and running. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think we have to see how Quebec Terrace goes. Um, and I think that's how the community members are also viewing this is, you know, we're hoping this is going to address um, some of the acute concerns there, um, but there's still 
questions about that. Um, and uh, along those lines, um, you know, we reached out to community members to make sure they knew we were discussing it today. Um, and so they did provide us some feedback, um, which I know, um, Mr. Paler, given your work here, I'm sure this is is in your plans, but one of the things they did want to make sure that we highlighted is uh, once this does get rolled out, um, you know, requesting meetings in the community and making sure that we had materials available in Spanish. Um, they also requested that um, if possible, if we had the forms um, for people to fill out and, and um, staff to help um, fill out the forms rather than say to people get online. Um, just thinking about how to set this up for success, um, they requested that we do some in-person um, work um, and help people kind of work through this process. And as always, we're happy to help facilitate that as well. Um, in addition, um, one of the things that um, folks did request as, as we're moving forward in this is looking for um, the possibility of increased enforcement, particularly, and this, I know we don't generally, I think, do enforcement around this time, but they said that times that were most critical are 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. Um, those tend to be times where, I think in this community, where if there's going to be a, a, a friction over parking, um, it is occurring at that time. And again, just thinking about how we can set this program up for success um, if that in the short term. Again, understanding we could not do that long term. Director Conklin? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I think the idea of in-person outreach for registration <laughs> for the program is a good one. And I'm not sure we would have had that idea on our own. Maybe we would have. Uh, but I appreciate that suggestion. I think we can move forward with something along those lines. In terms of the enforcement, I'm glad you brought that up. The enforcement of the residential permit program is typically a daytime right. enforcement activity, and this is exactly the opposite. So uh, we are engaging with the Montgomery County Police and the Executive's Office to figure out the best way to manage that, most likely with um, law enforcement leading the way in that enforcement, because it is not within the current structure of the RPP program contract support right. to provide overnight enforcement that the RPP issues or daytime issues by and large. So uh, we understand that's also consistent with community desire to have an increased presence of public safety in the neighborhood and not necessarily parking enforcement officers. Yes, that is something that we have also heard in our office. So um, I think that is it. I just want to say thank you again so much, and I support these changes. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Um, <clears throat> thank you. One of the things that I was going to bring up was, was the one-off nature of Quebec Terrace uh, versus a, a global change. And um, it, I, I guess it makes sense to see how it goes. I think as we move into the future, uh, with increased density as Thrive 2050 is um, implemented, we're going to see more and more density, which may impact uh, these programs. And, and I didn't even think of the parking to Purple Line, but that's going to also be the case uh, for BRT um, up my way, uh, there's no parking for BRT, and I think that's going to uh, be an interesting dynamic with uh, residential areas. So, um, I I agree with where we are now with just Quebec Terrace, but I think that we need to think about how that's going to roll out. I did have a question about the um, the change of the fee waiver. Um, so who is the applicant? The applicant is the community or the resident? Thank you, uh, Councilmember Malcolm. The applicant is a is a community entity like a homeowners association lead who is the liaison for mm -hmm. the community. And and are there situations where a group comes to you and can't pay the the, the uh, two hundred fifty dollar fee? A hearing fee. If if Mr. Tyree has anything additional to say after I make this statement, I, I welcome his remarks. Uh, Quebec Terrace, that situation was the first one that I've been made privy to where we had a, a situation where a community had expressed a, a concern about paying the fee. And how would you determine whether they uh, whether they can in fact pay the fee or whether they would prefer not to pay the fee? Typically when we're looking at uh, uh, communities that we would even consider that to be a potential or possibility, they would fall in the equity emphasis area in a location of the county where 
we know that they're historically underserved and there are some um, some financial constraints. So that is already, I don't want to say it's predetermined, but when we're looking at locations, we would be able to tell that that might be a community that would struggle financially and there mm -hmm. might be a concern about paying the fee. Yeah, I think that um, I, I agree with staff in that putting some parameters around what does, um, you know, what, how would you define a community that would need support? Because there's going to be, and, and I also, um, you know, we're not talking about a lot of applications. I mean, there have been 77 over the past 40 years. Um, but I, uh, how, how, I, I, how would you like to see it more defined, more yeah. clearly defined, so you don't have to make that decision as to whether this you should waive the fee? We, we had embarked on a journey of trying to come up with a set of metrics and other criteria. When we passed this um, regulation through the county attorney, their recommendation was this indigency standard because it was a, a defined, legally defensible term that could be applied. I'm not sure it meets the threshold of being easily determined during practice, uh, but I, I think we're comfortable trying to make this decision when a group comes to us by looking at some of the metrics in the community. Is it an area of persistent poverty? What are the typical household earning? Is it a low car, zero car area? Is it one of our equity emphasis areas? I think we can make those determinations on an ad hoc basis, but I do appreciate that it is um, imprecise in this regulation, but that's kind of how we were directed to pursue this uh, for legal sufficiency. Okay, and then um, the packet uh, makes a reference to Chevy Chase Lake, and I don't, and I, and I didn't understand that reference in the packet in relation to the ch proposed changes. So, I'm oh, sorry, Michael, no, I'm no, stepping no, on you. In, in the text changes, um, it relaxes the ability to uh, do residential permit parking adjacent to undeveloped property. Chevy Chase Lake Drive has a stream valley that's privately owned on one side. If that were actually park, it would also not be eligible, but um, we have the flexibility to determine whether its redevelopment is likely, and if not, we can do residential permit parking on the opposite side of the street from the residence. Otherwise, we weren't able to do residential permit parking on the opposite side of the street because it was adjacent to a different land use that might have its own Parking so, needs. In this case, it doesn't, but the regulation prohibited us from doing so that. So, in this, thank you. In the summary of changes on page two of the packet, I don't see that the, the that text pulled out. It doesn't jump out there on circle circle seven, number three is where those changes happen. Oh, okay. In the actual regulation. That was not intentional. That was an oversight packet. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. And then just um, uh, just for my own, when I when I looked at the map, I immediately thought, well, this doesn't this isn't going to impact my district, but it does. We've got a tiny little one near Quince Orchard um, High School, Darnstown and QO. And just for my historic purpose. I'm assuming that's because the high school is there and people from the high school were parking in the residential area is that why is that a rpp thank you councilmember that is correct the proximity to quince orchard high school that was a concern brought to us by residents i believe that the area was established around 2000 um uh, the students were, were parking on street during school hours so mm -hmm. uh, some uh, some blocks elected to change uh, some standard daytime no parking restrictions during school hours over to permit parking some have elected to leave it as is but that it that was sort of the catalyst behind the creation of the area you know the non-local students you know trying to vouch yeah i i live street. across the street from a high school so i know that and so when i looked at that i thought why and then it then it was like oh it's the high school so okay thank you that's it for me uh, thank you to my colleagues. I also want to uh, express my appreciation to the Department of Transportation. Uh, you know, uh, some of this uh, I would like to think was because last year I wrote a letter to you all specifically about Quebec Terrace. 
uh, last spring stating that some of the concerns regarding the cost of these fees uh, and uh, pushing for these changes uh, were up to $250, uh, which we know is cost prohibitive for that community in particular. And so anything that we can do to uh, minimize and mitigate uh, the, the costs of having equitable access to a parking spot and to transportation in general, I think, is the direction we want to move into. Uh, clearly, these regulations move us in that direction. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, the spirit in which we've landed in this spot. Uh, Mr. Kenny uh, or Director Conklin, uh, neither of these are method one or two regulations, right? So uh, unless there's an objection, they'll move forward. Oh, is it method, method two? Method Did I two. miss that? Yeah. OK, so it is method two. Um, uh, any objections from the committee? No? Nope. So we are unanimous in supporting this regulation. And with that, it has been a full morning of thoughtful conversation. Um, we're making progress in some areas, and hopefully the progress we've just made in uh, parking equity will extend to the Potomac. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>